Hey everyone, it's been a long time since I've done one of these gigantic compilations, so I thought I'd do one, and I really hope you all enjoy it, because it really is massive. There's a lot of different types of stories in here, and some of them are going to be very disturbing, ranging from murder to sexual assault, so if you want to avoid topics like that, you might want to skip this one altogether. All that being said though, Let's go ahead and get started, and I hope you all enjoy all these creepy stories. And if you ever want to send your own, you can send your story at southerncannibal.com. Without any more further interruptions, let's get started. And remember, to always, stay hungry. Hey everyone, I'm on night shift tonight so I figured I'd finally type this out. It's been ongoing for a few weeks, but it seems to be over now. I hope so at least. So I'm in between places to live right now. My old apartment got condemned, so I'm splitting my time between my brother's home and my boyfriend's home while trying to find an apartment. I'm a 24-year-old female, by the way. Unfortunately, however, we're in a really hardcore housing crisis down here right now, so it's taking longer than I'd like. So, my boyfriend has only been living here for a couple of months. He shares a yard with his neighbors, which is rented out by the same landlord. The neighbors really gave me no bad impressions at first. It's a husband, a wife, a daughter, and somebody whose relation to the family was never really made clear to me. He's a guy though, mid-40s. So the first thing that kind of got me thinking was the fact that their bedroom activities could be heard, like loudly. Anytime they were in the bedroom and we were outside, we could clearly hear everything. This wasn't a huge bother though. So anyways, one night around midnight, we could hear an actual chainsaw being used inside of their house, accompanied by screams. Well, my boyfriend had the brilliant idea to go over there but I managed to convince him that we should just call the police. I don't really know what the outcome of that was, but the next day, we saw all of them at one point or another, and nobody seemed to have been hurt. The next thing I found to be strange was when the wife had come outside as I was leaving for work. She was wearing nothing but sweatpants. To make it clear, I saw titties. She just carried on doing what she was doing, the next thing, which seemed to be the final straw for my boyfriend, was when he and I were trying to sleep. They had randomly started stomping on the floor inside of their house and started chanting. I'm not really sure what they were saying, if anything at all, but he was getting restless. So the next day, he went over to the husband, and he then told them that they needed to keep it down. Both he and his wife were acting confused, and they played dumb. My boyfriend jumped to the conclusion that they were definitely on drugs, and I won't lie, so did I, but they argued profusely that they didn't do any of that. Well, this verbal altercation lasted a few minutes before my boyfriend simply told them to stay on their side of the yard and to stay quiet. This lasted for a whole day before the wife had come outside wearing nothing but a sports bra and sleep shorts and then fell asleep by their fire pit. I'm a nurse by trade, so I went to see if she was okay, and I found out that she wasn't even breathing. As you can imagine, I called 911. An ambulance came and got her, along with two of the others, who were also all unconscious inside of the house. I had remembered after all of this was settled that my boyfriend had said once upon meeting them that the wife had mentioned that all of their windows were unopenable. Well, they had suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning. None of them passed during this ordeal, thankfully. All three survived, but I haven't seen them since, and I highly doubt that they'll be back in the house. I guess what I'm trying to say is be safe and make sure that your house is up to code before you move in. We're currently in the process of having our own house checked, just to be on the safe side. Before starting my story, I want to say that I don't remember the exact names of the individuals involved here. However, it is public information, 
and it's been on the local Arizona news, so I'm sure you could find more information by looking up the details. I'm just sharing my own personal knowledge and memory from this incident, so some of the details may be slightly incorrect or have changed after some more info was released. About 10 years ago or so, something really tragic occurred within the neighborhood. My mom was visiting her boyfriend at the time at his house, and the next day I drove over to his house to spend some time with them. When I arrived, I noticed that the house across the street was totally blocked off with caution tape, and the police and news crews were swarming the area. When I got inside and talked to my mom, I asked what was going on, and I was shocked. Here was the story that she told me. The next door neighbor was a quiet and kind Jewish man who lived with his wife and kids. I don't quite remember, but I believe he had two, a son and a daughter, who went to one of the best high schools in the county. His wife had worked a successful job, as he did as well. My mom has personally met him, and she would see him gardening in his front yard on occasion, and he genuinely seemed very sweet. Apparently, for whatever reason, Although we can theorize, the wife began to file for divorce. When it comes to the father, it was known that he recently discovered that he had a brain tumor. I'm not sure if this has contributed to his behavior here, but it's definitely haunting. One day his boss received a key in the mail from him, which was later to be discovered as the key to his home. Shortly after, early in the morning, the father woke up. He fatally shot his wife in bed, then he entered his children's rooms, and he did the same. After that, he wrapped them up in bed sheets, and he dragged their bodies into the garage, and he then loaded them into a van. He then locked all the doors, opened the garage door, and drove off. All of this occurred the morning before the police and news crews had arrived, all while my mom and boyfriend were across the street none the wiser. And no... They didn't hear any of the gunshots while they were sleeping. The father drove off and he ended up in a car chase with the police due to his neurotic driving. He began to head towards a deserted area out of the main suburb and pulled over. He then poured gasoline on the vehicle, setting the car on fire. Afterwards, he shot himself and he then burned with the bodies of his family. The story shocked everyone in our area. My heart really goes out to the loved ones involved, and of course, the tragic events that took the lives of the wife and children. But the most disturbing thing of all was that while he was killing his family, nobody knew. It was just another quiet night in another nice neighborhood. After my mom told me this story, I felt frozen in place, and I couldn't take my eyes off the house. It felt so wrong to just go on with my day. As time passed, however, and the police and news left, I went home to my own house and returned a couple of days later to visit. By now, the crime scene had been processed and the house had been cleaned. When I arrived again, it was dark and I had the most eerie feeling wash over me when I glanced at the house. Unlike the rest of the homes on the street, all of the lights were off on the porch and all the lights inside were off as well. All except one, that is. There was a window with blinds open in what looked like the bathroom, and the light was still on. Perhaps it was left on by one of the cleaning people, or the family who had come to take the belongings, but I was so disturbed by the feeling, and I couldn't help but think that someone might be inside. You truly never know people as much as you may think. On the outside, the father was just another friendly guy with a successful career, as well as a beautiful family. But when he got his brain tumor and his wife filed for divorce, he decided that he didn't want his family to move on without him. A tragic story indeed. Stay safe, everyone. My name is Ashley, but all of my friends call me Ash. And yeah, go ahead, make all the Pokemon jokes you want. I've heard them all. Apologies for the lengthy story, but at the time, all this went down when I was 12. 
We lived in the upper Midwest in a small city that only had about 669 people, mostly retirees and older folk and the like. I've watched a lot of people come and go, some by moving out and some by the Grim Reaper's cold hands. And of course, the creepy neighbor that I had to deal with for the last eight years. I don't even think the Grim Reaper would want to touch him with a 90-foot pole. My neighbor henceforth shall be known as Arthur, which is not his real name. Arthur was around 40. He had blonde hair with the most intense icy blue eyes that I'd ever seen in my life. It was like someone had carved chunks of ice right into his eyeballs and then put them into him. If it wasn't for the fact that he was mega weird and for what he did, honestly, he'd be like someone's really hot dad that you hear about in those semi-cringe covers of the fan parody of Stacy's mom called Stacy's Dad. He was married, and he had three kids, one of whom I was friends with, and we'll call her Jackie. So one day Jackie and I were at her house playing Mario Kart, and Arthur walks into the living room, and he starts to yell at Jackie about having the volume up way too loud while her brother Max was napping. He stops mid-yell when he then sees me turning the volume down. I look at him and I then say, Sorry sir, we'll try and keep it down. Sorry again for that. He looks me up and down and I kind of just blush since I'm wearing my favorite tank top that I made myself and jean shorts. He then turns and says to me, You like WWE? I said that I did, and he asked me which wrestler is my favorite. I told him that it was AJ Styles, since I made my tank top from a duplicate short sleeve shirt that I'd gotten for Christmas. He smiles, and he then says, You know, maybe you can stay the night. It is a Friday night after all, and he may be wrestling in a match tonight on SmackDown. We can watch it together. I politely declined, and I said I had to go. Jackie gave me a weird look, but I said my goodbyes and headed for the door. Suddenly, I then heard Arthur say behind me, Don't I get a goodbye? I just exited and ran all the way to my house, which was two streets down. About a week went by, and the next Friday after school, I had found a strange package on our porch stoop, and it had my name on it. It didn't look like the Amazon boxes my mom would get from time to time. No, it was just an ordinary cardboard mailer box with my name on it. It had my name in Sharpie and no return address or any indication of who sent it. I'd showed it to my mom when she got home from work and she told me to open it to see what it had inside. I did, and inside was an autographed 8x10 picture of AJ Styles and another shirt. This was the black and red Phenomenal Forever shirt like the one he wore while on Monday Night Raw while competing for the USA title. It was similar to the blue one and my custom tank top. I was floored by this. I then noticed a folded piece of printed paper with my name on it. I then opened it and it read, I hope you like the gift, sweetie. Hopefully we can meet sometime. And a little heart written in red pen. I was confused and a little bit creeped out. I put the box with the shirt in my closet and I'd put the note in a file folder, which I named Weird Letters from Stalker. I chuckled at my own childish title for the folder, but little did I know I was right about that title. About three days later, I saw yet another package. I opened it and I saw another picture, but this one had been created in Photoshop. It was a picture of me in my blue Phenomenal Forever tank top and jean shorts with AJ holding me to his side and we were smiling for the camera that was supposedly taking the picture. The note this time then said, I can get you a meeting with AJ if you want. I want to make all your dreams come true, sweetie. But I will soon. I shuddered. I had placed this note with the first one as well as the picture that was placed in the box in my closet. The letters had stopped for a little while, and I thought it was over, but about a month later, I received a letter and another package from my stalker. The package this time was one of those flat letter envelopes, and inside was another picture of me and AJ, but this one is our heads photoshopped on a picture of a man and woman 
having explicit sex and a pair of boxer briefs with white stains on them. No prizes for anyone who guesses what the white stains are. I looked at the note. What it said made me want to puke and my blood run cold. Why don't you like my gift, sweetie? I'm going to make you mine. I'm coming for you and you can't do anything about it. I think I actually screamed. I was home alone and my parents had gone to see friends in the next town over and celebrate the wife of the friend's birthday. I told them I would be okay, but I wasn't. I heard someone knocking at the door and when I went to check who it was, lo and behold, it was Arthur. He had actually managed to then break into my house. In a panic, I dialed 911, letting them know I had very little time and explain what was going on as best as I could and that they needed to send the police out immediately. I then ran to my room and I locked the door, trying to buy some time until the police showed up. Arthur eventually made it to my room, however. Once he broke in, it was like I was in a scene of my very own horror movie. He looked like one of those axe murderers that enter a house and do unspeakable things to the plucky heroine before she's maimed or killed. He then grabbed me and dragged me, kicking and screaming by my hair. He told me how he had many plans with me, things that I would never consent to. But just as he was about to have his way with me, a miracle happened. I heard the sirens coming down my street. The police had arrived. Shortly after, I heard them busting inside the house and shouting, Police! Is anyone here? I screamed for help, letting them know that we're upstairs and that he's trying to rape me, all while Arthur is trying to cover my mouth with his hands as I do so. The police officers came charging in, and Arthur tried to escape out of my bedroom window. But he didn't get near it enough before he was tackled, then restrained and taken away. My parents rushed home immediately, and they were told everything when they got there. Arthur was charged with attempted sexual assault on a minor, as well as many other things that I can't really remember. After a long drawn out trial, he was eventually sentenced to prison. My friend Jackie claimed that she had no idea that her dad was such a sick fuck. But just a week after the events of that night, she stopped talking to me entirely, blaming me for the fact that she lost her dad. She also claimed that everything that happened to me was all lies, and that her dad would never do those things. I didn't even care. The way she spoke to me and blamed me for her creepy stalker dad? Really? With a friend like that, who needs an enemy? I'm doing a little better now. I've been to counseling and I've slowly been getting over the nightmares and the fear of being home alone. Moving to the southeastern part of the U.S. has helped out a lot. I still love the WWE and AJ Styles, but I still get chills thinking about what could have happened to me because of my creepy, fucked up, and revolting neighbor. Here's some information to put my story in place. When this happened, I was 28 years old. I had moved into a duplex apartment on the second floor. The apartment was in a quiet neighborhood in Quebec City, Canada. The old lady on the first floor was really nice. She was 87 years old, and her children, who were the landlords, came each day to check on her, as well as take care of the property. Watering the plants, flowers, mowing the lawn, etc. I was feeling pretty safe in this area, as a woman. Quebec City is a really safe place in general, but some bad things have happened here just like anywhere else. So in the first week of my moving there, I had met my new neighbor. Let's call him Joe. Joe seemed to be around 50 years old. He was a little bit overweight, and he then approached me while I was cleaning my car. Our parking lots were literally like right next to each other separated by tiny bushes. The conversation then went like this. Hey, I'm Joe. You just moved in? I replied back with, Oh, hi, yeah, I'm Catherine. How are you? And the discussion continued like normal, until he then said, So, you're a judge? I didn't understand the question at first. 
But then I remembered that I had talked with the other neighbor, and I told him I was a paralegal. So I then explained it to him, and he laughed. It was at this moment that I realized that this neighborhood was pretty chatty. A couple of weeks go by, and Joe seems to always be outside whenever I arrive in my car. Every time I park and get out of my car, he's there. I think he must have felt pretty lonely and just wanted to talk or something. But for me, I thought it was really weird that every time I got to my apartment at 9pm, Joe's always there outside in his parking lot. He would always say hi to me, as if he just always wanted to check on me. One time he asked me, Hey, do you want to come see my tomato plants? You have tomatoes too, I think. We can drink a glass of wine. What do you prefer, red or white? He gave me such weird vibes, and I didn't want to go. I was feeling so uncomfortable, and I didn't know what to say. I told him red, and I then ran to my door, thinking that he would go away at this point. One time I was sleeping, and I had heard a knock on my door. I wasn't expecting anyone, so I didn't want to go see who it was. But afterwards, I thought that maybe it could be the landlord, so I got up to see who it was. It was Joe. He then said to me, The window of your car is open, and it's raining. I told him thank you, even though I was still feeling uncomfortable. There was also this one time that really scared me. Joe was living at the second floor in the duplex apartment right next door. His tiny window would face my kitchen window. And unfortunately, I just didn't really have the time to install a curtain. So while I was doing my dishes, I turned to grab some glasses on the counter, and I could see that Joe was staring at me through his window. He wasn't moving at all, just staring at me. I had a damn panic attack. I actually went and hid in the living room. I managed to call one of my friends, and she came over, and she helped me install a sheet for the night on the window. I didn't sleep at all during this night. After that, in the following weeks, I didn't really remember seeing Joe that much. Whenever we would see each other, he'd just say hi to me, and I was really relieved that that's all that happened. So let's skip forward a little. About a year passed, and it was now summer. I was leaving my apartment to go to the grocery store, and I met Joe while I was walking. He said, Hey, I'm going to be moving. I'm sorry I won't be here to protect you anymore. I responded back with, Um, protect me from what? You know, the guys who live on the first floor. They're not murderers, but... And he said nothing more than that. We said goodbye, and that was it. About a week later, I had arrived from work, and there was a paper bag in front of my door. I took it and opened it, and it was a little bottle of wine from Joe, with a note on it. I'm so glad that I got to know you. It's really sad that we never got to enjoy our glass of wine. Now you can. Take care. I threw the wine in the sink. So after all this time, I guess he had never once forgot about the wine. Nothing else really happened aside from that. I know this may not be that scary to a lot of you, but I just didn't reciprocate the same feelings that he did, and his behavior just really creeped me out. Wherever Joe is now, I hope he's happy, but I really don't want to see him again. I just want to live in peace without anyone bothering me, or creeping me out. Stay safe out there, everyone. A bit of context first. My cat likes to go outside every day. In the morning, he follows us to the door, takes the elevator down with us, then goes about his day outside until we bring him back home again in the evening. Now, my cat isn't the most punctual guy, so it's pretty common for him to stay much later in the neighborhood, sometimes well into the night or for several days or he gets bored and doesn't play for more than two hours and wants to get back inside. The problem is that we're not home, so he just has to wait. My family and I live in an apartment on the first floor, so my cat's solution is to sit under one of our balconies 
and meow at the top of his lungs to get our attention. When we're home, it works perfectly fine, but when we're not, it's a lot less effective. So our solution was to gently ask our neighbors that have the key to our apartment to bring him up so he doesn't have to wait outside all day. Those that don't have the key sometimes let him inside the building so he's not literally outside. For example, when it's raining. Our apartment is a bit special because it's bigger than the others. So to get inside, there are two ways when you get into the main hall. One, take the stairs to the left and open the door that has two locks. Two, use the elevator with the special key that goes directly inside our apartment and the door only has one lock. The cat used the second option, and me too because we're both lazy. But when the neighbors that don't have the key let him inside the building, he goes up the stairs and waits. Since I usually use the elevator from the parking, two floors below, that means I don't see him waiting in the hall, and he meows outside the door to get me to open up for him, or my dad and mom. All around we have our habits with my parents and neighbors, and it works fairly well. Now you know how everything goes with my little guy. Anyway, here's what happened a while ago. My parents like the outdoors very much, so I'm usually left alone in the weekends. Generally, it means taking care of the chores and inviting my friends over so we can have the apartment to ourselves, which is pretty nice. This time I was alone. It was late, 11 p.m.-ish and I was just chilling in the living room before hearing me yowling over the sound of the TV. Someone let my cat in the building, and he's waiting outside the door. I took my keys, and I started opening the first lock. I don't know about other pet owners, but I know that my cat meows by heart. It's kind of a rising meow that's very high-pitched and very cute at the same time, and that also has a specific rhythm because I've been hearing it nearly every day for five years so I stopped. The noise isn't what it usually is. It's too deep and just... off. This isn't my cat outside my door, and he's the only cat around that knows he has to wait by the door and scream to be let inside. By that point, I'd stopped halfway through opening the door, and I waited to hear him again, and I noticed scratching. My cat never scratches that door, at that point, I'm super weirded out by the situation, but the meowing is getting super loud, and I didn't want the neighbors to be woken up. So I continued with my key, but suddenly, I hear another noise that freaked me out. A cough. For the record, I'm not a very cautious person, and in my whole 21 years of living in this apartment, I must have looked in the peephole a total of maybe five times, but a small part of my brain told me to do it that night. And thank God it did. So I let go of my keys, and I put my eye against the door, and I saw it. A man standing there, fucking me yowing in front of my door. To say that I was terrified is really an understatement, but my heart stopped. I just stood there petrified for what felt like an hour. I don't really know how long it took for me to move again, but eventually my body just took over, I guess. I did what you'd expect, ran for my phone, stood in the corner of the living room, and I called the police. By the time they came, there was nobody in front of the door. I can't even remember when the meowing stopped, and they just took my testimony before telling me to be cautious, and then they left. To this day, I still don't know what the meowing guy wanted. I'm not sure I want to anyway. I also don't know how he got inside the building since you need a key to access it, and also how he knew that I would open the door if he imitated my cat in front of it. At least I will be careful from now on. Ah, and my cat eventually came back since then. He's actually sleeping in my bed as I write this. The story is my best friend Chloe's story, but somehow I got brought into the craziness of her ex-boyfriend. Chloe was 14 at the time when she got together with her boyfriend named Alex. Even from the start, he was very abusive. He would call her things like a whore, a slut, etc. When they got deeper in the relationship, he would slowly push away all of her friends, including me. 
when she had broken up with him on one of the many times, she FaceTimed me randomly. We weren't really friends at this time, but I still had a bad feeling, so I decided to answer it. When I answered her FaceTime, she had whispered that Alex was at her window, and in the call, you could hear knocking on her window. Her room was in the basement, so it's a very small window. He would have to lay down or crouch to knock on it. This scared me, so I told her to call the police or go upstairs and get her mom, but she was frozen in fear, and she wouldn't even answer my questions. I went out and told my dad just in case of an emergency. When she didn't hear knocking for 15 minutes, we thought he left. I saw the horror on her face when I then heard the window break open. It was Alex trying to climb through the window. I quickly texted her mom while still on the phone with her. All you could hear was Chloe's screams and her telling him to leave. When he had noticed she was on the phone with someone, he accused her of being on the phone with a boy. When she had told him it was me, he freaked out though still trying to get in the window while cussing me out. Chloe slapped him in the face, doing anything she could to get him to leave. I felt relieved when I then heard her mom yell her name, with Alex leaving out the window, and he was gone. They called and talked to the police, and so did I, since I was a witness on the phone. A police report was made, but sadly, that wasn't the end of this. She got back together with him out of fear for her family, as he would threaten to kill them. Chloe had been held at gunpoint through physical assault, sexual assault, and also emotional assault. After they broke up for the last time, he then turned his focus onto me. He would try to text me, and he would try to get with me. I ended up blocking him and reported his account. We had seen him a few times after all this. The last encounter I had with him was at a fair in our hometown. Me and Chloe were walking around and we were looking for a ride to go on, and that's when I saw him. He was staring at us. I felt immediately uncomfortable, and stupidly, I told Chloe and I pointed at him. After that, he started walking over to us. The look in his eyes didn't even look human, he looked plain evil. We ran away. We ran all the way to my house, which was blocks away. We haven't seen him since, but I really do fear for anyone who becomes romantically involved with him. I used to be one of those girls who ignored all of the red flags when it came to the men in my life. I was so desperate to find the perfect man for me that I always tried to make excuses and also rationalizations for their behaviors. This is the perfect story to educate young women to never ignore that voice in the back of your head. The one that's screaming, something's off here. Needing love just isn't worth the risks. It was a warm, sunny afternoon, and I was walking home from work. I didn't want to go back to my lonely apartment on such a beautiful day. So as I was coming up to my local park, I decided to go sit on the swings and enjoy the cool breeze and just soak in the beautiful sunshine, and just clear my head from the stressful work day. Across the park, I noticed a tall, handsome man walking his dog. I saw that he was blatantly staring at me, and it was obvious he noticed. I couldn't help but stare at him. It didn't take long before he made his way over to me, and he asked what I was doing all alone on such a beautiful day. His dog got close enough to me, and he jumped on my lap and he started rubbing his head all over me and licking me. I loved animals, so I didn't get alarmed that a strange dog was on me. He then started laughing, and then said, Oh wow, he's a pretty good judge of character. You must be a real sweetheart. I also started laughing, and I then said that it's been a long day, and I said I needed that to brighten my day. We started making small talk, and eventually, he had stated that his own life hasn't been so swell lately either. He then said to me, Maybe tomorrow we can meet back here, and then go for a walk and talk some more. I agreed, and I met him promptly at 5pm the next day. There he was, looking even more handsome the next day, as if he purposefully spiffed himself up more to see me that day. 
We walked for a while, and we asked each other the normal questions that people ask when first getting to know each other. I noticed that his phone kept going off, and each time he would hit the ignore button. I didn't have the nerve to bring it up because I didn't want to seem too nosy, especially since we had just met, but he had started to notice I was noticing. It lets out a big huff, and then says, I'm so sorry, but my ex from six months ago has been harassing me ever since we broke up. She just can't let go, and she's been calling me and coming up with a million reasons to try and talk to me. First alarm bell started going off in my head. I've had exes harass me too, but I usually blocked them or reported them, and then they finally gave up. Why wouldn't he just do those things? But he was so intriguing, and like I said earlier, I ignored all the red flags in my younger years. The phone would not stop ringing, and his text alerts were constantly beeping. I told him why not just block her number or turn her phone off, that that would drive me absolutely mad. He said they had already blocked over 100 of these pinger numbers that she had made to call him, and at this point it was just easier to be patient and just hope that she'll eventually give up. He eventually turned his phone on silent and he went into more about their relationship and why it ended. He said that she would just show up wherever he was at when they were together. She would show up to his work to spy on him. She would show up to the gym. She would even show up to his parents' house when he was there visiting. If they weren't together at all times, she would lose her mind and make his life a living hell. Even when they were together, she was so clingy. She would even get upset if he would go to the bathroom or not put his arm or hand on her at all times. He said that he put up with it for so long because he felt bad for her, as she also lived a very horrible childhood. Her dad had left her when she was five, and her mom was a drug addict. Besides her grandma, he was all she had. He knew that she had abandonment issues, but just couldn't take it anymore. He was telling me how he felt so bad for her, and how he just really hoped that one day she'll meet someone and that all of this will come to an end. I emphasize with Josh because I know what it was like for an ex to just not let go, but at the same time, it was unnerving. I'm not the confrontational type, and it was pretty scary the thought of someone's crazy ex being hung up on the guy that I'm interested in. We finally got off the subject, and we went on to lighter, less serious conversations. I told him I was getting hungry, and I was going to head back home to make some dinner. Josh then smiles and says, Well, I was going to do the same, actually. Would you possibly want to come to my place? I can cook us both something. I never really had a guy offer to cook me dinner this early on. It was usually take me out to dinner. So the thought was kind of romantic in my head. So I agreed. His apartment complex was literally the neighboring apartment complex across the street from mine so I thought that was pretty convenient that I wasn't that far from home when it was time to leave after dinner. The night seemed to be going absolutely perfect. The dinner he made was one of my favorites, chicken stir-fry, followed by more long conversations about life and where we stood on religion, as well as politics and those deep conversations that really get you to know someone's character, then followed by laughing and smiles. And until things got quite intense, and before I knew it, we were kissing, followed by some passion and love making. During this, I kept hearing a light tapping coming from the living room. Not wanting to awkwardly interrupt the mood, I didn't say anything, and the tapping started getting louder and faster. Josh jumped up and then said, What is that noise? Do you hear that? The tapping sound went away all of a sudden. Buck, his dog, came into the bedroom and was super excited. He jumped on Josh and he wasn't acting like himself. Buck was always calm and laid back from what I had witnessed. Between the weird tapping and Buck, let's just say the mood took a dark turn. We both looked at each other and put our clothes back on. Buck ran back down the dark hall and even though I had this pit of fear in my stomach, I followed behind Josh into the dark hall and dining room which was also part of the living room. As we approached the dining room, I heard the tapping noise again as Josh flipped the light switch on. Josh gasped. Kelly! 
There sat his crazy ex, tapping her long fang nails on the dining room table with the most evil smirk on her face. Every part of me wanted to run back into his bedroom and lock the door, but the fear had me frozen and I couldn't move. Hi, Josh. Remember me? Obviously not because you're here fucking some whore. Josh then screamed and asked her, How the hell did you even get in here? Kelly let out this creepy giggle and then said, Does that really matter? You never cared how I got in when I lived here, did you? You never cared about anything, Josh. You never fucking cared about me or how I feel. You only care about Josh, and that's it. Why don't you tell her, Josh? Tell her who you really love. And that's yourself. Josh starts screaming at Kelly to get out or he's calling the police. Kelly starts laughing loud this time, then saying, No, why don't you both sit down? We all have some shit we're going to sort out. Josh immediately demands her to get out once again, but she then sternly says, I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying to you. You both need to sit down and talk to me. This isn't a request. This is a demand. Kelly's hand slips into the purse that she was sitting on her lap and pulls out a pistol. I'm still frozen in fear even with her command to sit down, and I can't move. I'm paralyzed and seconds away from a stroke. Josh looks at me and then says, Lily, Lily, sit down. She's got a gun. Trembling, I sat down try not to make eye contact with her, or even Josh, in fear that it would upset her that I was looking at the man she was so obsessed with. Kelly starts crying. Why, Josh? Why? Look what you've made me do. Am I so disgusting and repulse you that much that you just don't want me? Buck at this time was barking, and he was starting to jump on me, and he was whining and rubbing his head on my leg. I know that dogs can sometimes sense emotions, and he knew I needed some comfort. Weirdly enough, Buck gave me strength within, and I finally started getting my head clear enough to finally realize this was a reality, and I had to be calm and clear-minded. Josh had tears in his eyes. Let her go, Kelly, so we can be alone, and I'll answer every question you have. I'll talk to you as long as you want me to. Kelly started crying, then saying, Why, Josh? So you can tell me how much you care about me, but not enough to want to be with me? Not enough to love me? So you can break my heart all over again? Josh muffles back his tears, and then says, Kelly, I do love you. I just needed time away from you to realize it. I didn't know you loved me this much to do all this. If I would have known that, I would have never let you go. Kelly's tears then turned back into that evil smirk. You honestly want me to believe that all of a sudden, when I have a gun pointed right at you and your girlfriend, who you literally just got done sleeping with? Yeah, you really love me, huh? Do you think I'm that fucking stupid? So you not only care about me, but you also think I'm a fucking moron. Josh then screams. I swear I do love you. You're beautiful. You're smart. And no one's ever treated me as good as you did. Kelly then lets out a laugh. But now it's too late. Now you and your girlfriend can hurt like I hurt when I blow your brains out all over this fucking room. Josh starts crying again. You don't have to do this. Please, let's just go into the bedroom and talk. I want you. Let me just prove it to you. Kelly then slams her fist on the table. Joshua, that's over now. Unfortunately, your time's come to an end. Kelly looks at me and then smiles. Tell Josh his time's come to an end. I nodded no as I kept petting Buck under the table. Kelly then screams. I said, tell him his time's come to an end before I kill you first. Finally, tears pour from my face as I shake. No, I said. Please stop this. Kelly starts laughing hysterically. I've got both of you guys crying now. I guess I really am that good, aren't I, Josh? Why don't you get over here and kiss me? And when you kiss me, prove to me that you really love me. Without hesitation... 
Josh leans over from his chair, and he starts kissing her, and he definitely made a count. You would never thought we were in this awful situation or anyone else was even in the room but them. He starts kissing down her neck, and I then watched as his hand goes for the gun, and my immediate reaction was to hit the ground. The two of them both fell out of their chairs and were wrestling around on the ground, with Bug going crazy on top of them. The gun went off, and the sound was absolutely piercing. I jumped back, not knowing who got shot, but by some grace of God, I had grown some strength, and I immediately grabbed a chair, and I started hitting Kelly in the head with it, as she was now down on the ground. I heard Josh yelling on the ground, I got the gun! Get out of here! I ran for my life, running up the stairs, as his apartment was on the bottom floor. I hear Josh screaming not too far from behind me. I've been shot. Call for an ambulance. I make it to someone's door, and they reluctantly let me inside to call the police. Josh standing in the hall, with Buck right by his side. Josh had been shot in the shoulder. The police arrived, and an ambulance rushed Josh to the hospital immediately. I stayed behind to explain everything that happened. The second ambulance got there to take Kelly, who had suffered some head injuries, but nothing serious. I went with the police officers back to the station for more intense questioning, and I was then told that I wasn't to see Josh until they have him questioned. I eventually got back to my apartment, where I immediately called my mom to come get me. I was in no shape to be alone with everything that had happened to me. A week later, I got a phone call from Josh. Are you alright? I'm so, so sorry I got you involved in this. I knew it wasn't his fault, but a part of me still blamed him. Why didn't you call the police on her sooner? Why did you wait so long to do something about this? You could have prevented this happening. As much as I felt bad for him, all I could think about was correlating all the bad stuff that happened with him, and I knew I couldn't risk being with him. I apologized, but I told him I couldn't have anything to do with him after all this. I wished him nothing but the best, and that I really hoped she paid for what she did. Unfortunately, she only ended up getting seven years. As for me, I ended up getting a life full of fear and PTSD from the whole ordeal, and I'm sure Josh did too. Even now and again, Josh will send me a message online, and he'll check to see how I'm doing but I haven't laid eyes on him after the trial. He moved away after the event. Buck ended up passing away last year, according to him when we last spoke. That dog gave me so much strength when I needed it. This is what I meant when I said earlier in my story. Never ignore the red flags. I wanted so badly to be with someone that I ignored that he had a crazy ex, not knowing what was soon coming my way and there really are so many red flags people will show you. Do not ignore the screaming voice telling you not to do this. Listen to it. Twelve years ago, I was a high school graduate. I definitely fell in with the wrong crowd, and I made sure to graduate. I had just gotten out of an emotionally abusive relationship and one of my girlfriends asked me if I wanted to go out and get my mind off things. We weren't old enough to drink, not that it stopped us, but we decided to go hang out at a park just outside of town and hike some trails. We arrive at this park, and she then surprises me with two of her friends that I've never met, young about our age, and they had the attractive bad boy type look. My weakness at the time, of course. Right away, one guy walks right over to me, and he introduces himself. We'll call him Mark. He's immediately forward. I'm vulnerable. I don't even know or care what the red flags are at the time. I ate that attention right up. He loved to party, smoke, and drink. I considered this light stuff. I was basically about the same things, so we immediately became inseparable. During this time... I had began to notice some weird things that I had never seen before. Mark would disappear while I was asleep. Sometimes my car would be gone, and my wallet too. I finally brought it up because he didn't come back in time for me to go to work, so it was officially an issue for me then. 
He would find some weird excuses like, my mom needed something from the store, or I got called into work. Weird things like this happened for a year. Then his mother kicked him out of her house. I was living with my parents at the time as well, so I asked them if he could come stay for a bit, and they agreed because my parents are good people. My dad and his wife aren't poor, but they aren't rich. As Mark stayed at our house, we noticed all sorts of things disappear. Same stuff with my car, and never telling me where he was going or asking to use it. I needed to know what was going on, so I tore my bedroom apart. I found a crack stem fully loaded under my mattress, and I called him immediately about it. What the fuck is this? Where are you? And where's my car? So of course he comes back to apologize, and he says he wants to get help. He'll stop. Whatever he has to do. So of course I'm 19 and I think I'm in love, so I believe what he says. I ended up getting an apartment not too far away from my parents, and we go live there because my parents have finally decided that they don't like Mark. They see it for what it is, but I don't. We partied, hard, and I dropped out of college. I found myself pregnant at 20 years old with Mark's baby. By this time, I'm supporting us financially, as well as his drug habit, because I thought this is what I had to do for my unborn kid. His habit gets so out of control that he actually starts robbing people. He committed criminal trespass and grand larceny on my parents and my childhood house. Still to this day, he denies it, but he pled guilty because his lawyer said it was the best idea at the time. I'm very pregnant at this point. One day I'm at work in the middle of my 10 hour shift and I get a Facebook message from a strange woman claiming she saw my car drive away from her house after a bunch of her electronics went missing and she's calling the police if she doesn't get it all back by 5 p.m. that day. He drops me off, so I have no way to get anywhere to do anything. I called his phone and I told him what this lady said, but he denies it. Whatever and he then pulls up at the end of my shift, sweating like he ran a marathon, and my car has no gas in it. After some loud exchanges from me, he tells me he took everything to the trap house and he traded it for drugs. So here I am about to pop, driving him to the trap house. I pull up, and he then says, What am I supposed to do? You don't have any money. So I tell him, I don't give a fuck. Suck a dick for all I care. Go get her shit back. So he moseys up on the door and goes inside. I waited for 10 minutes. He comes back out with nothing. So I drive us back home defeated. The next day, I got a call from the local police asking that I come in for questioning. The lady actually held up her end of the bargain. Why wouldn't she? I ended up getting interrogated for this mess even though I wasn't even involved. The lady eventually ended up dropping the charges because she felt very sorry for me, which isn't even a win. So much had happened between then and when my daughter was born. She was six weeks premature from all my stress, so I was there with her alone for most of it. I brought her home on my 21st birthday. It was the best day of my life. Something changed in me that day because I found paraphernalia again in my apartment after I brought her home and I told him to leave, never come back. He stole my car, outran three towns, and then he crashed my car. I'm so thankful that my kids saved my life that day. I can't imagine what it would have been like to not get out of that. He's not in our lives. Just these last couple of years, he's really gotten himself in a lot of trouble. He beat his wife in front of the kids, and he stole her car for a week. Then when she stopped giving him money for drugs, he had robbed an old woman in a grocery store parking lot. He dragged her with the car because she wouldn't let go of her purse. She was in critical condition for quite some time. I really hope she made it. His wife is now in the process of getting a divorce, and I'm really happy she's getting out. He's published everywhere. I can link an article for purpose of visual, but I'm honestly still embarrassed to even be associated with him in any way. Thank you for listening to my story. I know it isn't the normal story, but it honestly felt good for me to share it with you. Be safe out there, everyone.
This happened almost three years ago, and I do apologize on how long it'll be. I met my close friend Michaela back in high school in 2015, where I was a junior and she was a freshman. We originally started out as partners for our psychology class, but our relationship grew and we saw each other as close friends, and at times, a mentor and mentee, since Michaela was interested in pursuing art after high school, just like me. After I graduated, I began my studio art studies at my local university, and a while later, Michaela got accepted into the same art program as me, but chose to start at our local community college to save money, which I completely agreed with and fully supported. After all, there's no shame in going to community college first. Now it's February 2019 at this point. It had been a year since I last got to sit down with Michaela and catch up on the latest events in our lives, given that we've been focused on all our studies. We decided to meet up at this particular Starbucks location since it was a block away from the community's college downtown campus where Michaela's class was at, and it was three blocks from the University School of Art where I was. We arrived and we greeted each other excitedly, and that was when Michaela then introduces her boyfriend at the time, Eric. I recognized him as one of the annoying kids that went on our high school's Japan trip with me, my boyfriend, our three friends, and 16 other students back in the summer of 2017. We exchanged greetings, and after a few minutes, Michaela and Eric said their goodbyes since he had to attend his next class at the downtown campus. Michaela and I talked for about three hours about anything and everything. I bring up Eric, and that's when Michaela suddenly laid it out on me that he was a complete nutbag. She explained how Eric was this clingy, possessive type of guy who got angry with Michaela with just about anything that had to do with women and art. Eric once got mad at her for drawing a nude model in her figure drawing art class. Michaela tried explaining that it was because art students had to draw the human anatomy in various poses, but he declared it as cheating somehow. He got mad when Michaela and him went to the art museum, and she happened to stare at an artwork of a nude woman. Eric was pretty much calling Michaela a cheater, as well as a closeted lesbian. You would think whether someone is an art person or not, they would understand and even appreciate the arts of the human body but not Eric. Now, here's where it gets a little contradictory. Now, Michaela's a bit of an anime fan. I often recommend her shows that she would be interested in, and I warn her of other shows that she can tread carefully if she ever chooses to watch. Eric, however, was not like that. He begged and encouraged Michaela to watch the anime Goblin Slayer, and without warning her, she was horrified. Correct me if I'm wrong, but for those who don't know, slight trigger warning here, but I believe there's a scene in the very first episode where a character is raped by goblins. I myself have never seen it, but I heard you can hear and see the blurred out image of the goblins doing the act as it pans away. Eric didn't understand why Michaela didn't like the episode and had refused to watch the show entirely, so he was annoyed that she felt a little sick from the episode. Another contradictory thing about Eric is that while he hates Michaela looking at the human body, he openly shared with Michaela his hentai image collections, with many being underage anime girls. Michaela knew about hentai in general, but she felt disgusted and annoyed at Eric. So it's okay with him to like something that has to do with naked fictional characters, but it wasn't okay for Michaela when it comes to her studies. Michaela's choice in guys had been very poor but I understand that she's trying to grow and move away from ending up like her mom. I mean, who would have ever thought that this is how Eric was? While Michaela was telling me about Eric and all that was mentioned, she got a text from him. Her eyes then widened in horror. Remember when I said it had been about three hours of me and Michaela talking? Well, Eric had texted Michaela, asking if she was done with me yet. Turns out, he never even went to class. He walked back to campus to pick up his car, drove back to Starbucks, and then parked at a corner where we couldn't see him from inside. We both went from horrified to pissed. Now in general, you know that if you haven't seen a friend in a really long time, you just want to sit down and chat for a really long time, right? 
Well, apparently Eric assumed we were just going to be talking for 30 minutes, not three hours. He was angry at Michaela, and he was demanding her to get in the car so he can take her home. If I could drive, I would have immediately offered her a ride home, but I didn't have my license yet. Michaela assured me many times, however, and she stated she'll be fine. I walked her to Eric's car. He comes out and says, Didn't think it would be a long time for you two to talk. And he then extends his hand out for a goodbye shake. I clasped his hand and I gripped it tightly, saying, Yeah, Michaela and I love talking. You know, that's what happens when you catch up with a friend that you haven't seen in about a year. Eric tried letting go of my hand, but I held on. Michaela's like my little sister, and I expect for her to arrive home unharmed. I really don't need you to fuck around and find out from me. I let go of Eric's hand, and I smiled. I hugged Michaela, and I whispered for her to let me know when she gets home. A while later, she texted me she was home safe. Fast forward about two months later, and again, Michaela and I met up for lunch. She explains to me that after they left Starbucks, Eric had argued with Michaela and was convinced I was in love with her and that I was trying to steal her away from him. Eric was angry, stating how badly he wanted to hurt Michaela, but that he was restraining himself from doing so. Their argument became a heated shouting match, and instead of physically hitting one another, Michaela punched the dashboard and Eric punched his windshield. Without further incident, Michaela got home safe, only with a tender fist pretty much. Michaela and Eric have broken up about two weeks prior to our new lunch date, but he's been stalking her. It's gone to the point that Eric has skipped attending his classes at the downtown campus, and he drives 15 minutes to go to the community college's west campus where the majority of Michaela's classes are. So, on the night Michaela broke it off with Eric, he couldn't cope with the news, and he took off running in the darkness of Michaela's neighborhood. She didn't know whether to look for him or not, but decided to just leave him. About a half hour later, she gets a call from him saying he's been crying and that he was hiding under his car, hoping Michaela would look for him. Already done with his shit at this point, she tells him to fuck off. Now, back to our lunch date. Michaela acknowledged that Eric was really bringing out the worst of her, to where she was physically punching things in frustration, as well as having verbal shouting matches with Eric. I was even more worried about Michaela's safety, and I suggested a restraining order. She gladly announced that she had actually filed for one after she broke up with Eric, and it was already in effect. Our lunch date ended, and a week later, Michaela calls asking if I could pick her up at the West Campus when her art class was over at 4 p.m. Since I already had my license, I happily obliged. From the university to the West Campus, it's a 30-minute drive, 20 without any traffic. I got there five minutes before a class was to be dismissed. As I was waiting, I saw Eric pacing the R building's entrance. The way that Michaela's class is laid out is that the entrance to the R building opens and it leads you to two hallways in which there's four classes in each. Michaela's class was in the left hallway to the very end, so she wouldn't know about Eric standing outside the building's entrance. I called her, and I then warned her about Eric. Luckily, when class ended, Michaela was escorted out to my car by her instructor, who was well aware of the situation. I'm not sure where the campus security was at the time, since this was a small campus, and they didn't see the need to have one patrolling the area. Michaela gets in the car, and she quickly asks if we can drive her to her friend's house where she'll be staying at. It was a 30-minute drive up north, and I knew where her friend had lived at since I recognized the streets, as a childhood friend of mine lived in the area. I didn't hesitate to floor it out of the campus. Michaela's friend, who we'll call Jade, lived in a gated community, and in order for you to enter, you need to type in the code to gain access. Michaela gave me the code, and she notified Jade we were driving to her house, which was ETA five minutes. Jade was outside when we arrived, and out of courtesy, Jade had invited me in the house as well to cool down for a few. I was letting my guard down, since I'd believe Michaela was safe here in the gated community. However, 
The evening was setting in. I was getting ready to leave, and I was saying my goodbyes to Jade and Michaela. Their backs were turned to the sliding glass door of the backyard, and I was facing them in the doors. There was still a bit of sunlight left outside, and to my horror, the last bit of sunlight showed the silhouette of a figure jumping down from the wall. I then yelled, and the girls turned around quickly to then see the silhouette of Eric. Now, I was very stupid, but my adrenaline kicked in, and I immediately ran towards Eric after seeing that he was stumbling after landing wrong, when he had previously jumped the six or seven foot wall. He quickly got up, and he charged at me too. And though Eric was five foot four, I do admit I'm a little on the heavier side, at five one for muscles and fat. I really like to think that it's my heavier side that helped, but maybe it was the adrenaline too, but I was able to tackle Eric to the ground. I struggled to hold him in place, but the skinny nut bag broke free from my grasp, and he proceeded to run at Michaela and Jade, who were already on the phone with the police. I tried tackling him once more, while he then yelled out, It's all your fault. It's everyone's fault. You're all taking her away from me. I just began laughing and saying, You're a fucking delusional shit. It's you. He tried spitting at me, but for fun, I decided to punch him square in his face twice. I told you you'd fuck around and find out, didn't I? Jade ran out the back, and she looked to see how he managed to scale the wall. Turns out, Eric had grabbed an old chair from a nearby alley, and he decided to bet his chances of jumping as high as he could and use his upper strength to hoist him up. I didn't understand how he knew Michaela was going to be at Jade's, but turns out, Eric had found out from one of Michaela's friends who revealed the location. Eric already knew where Jade lived, but without the access code, he decided to scale the wall in hopes to talk to Michaela, without caring for the restraining order. Eventually, the cops arrived quickly, and Eric was arrested. He was found to have hidden a knife, but in the midst of him landing wrong, he didn't prepare to take out his knife, let alone didn't expect for me to come out charging at him. If it weren't for me noticing Eric, or if I never accepted Jade's invitation to come inside, there's a good chance it would have ended completely different. After all this, Eric was charged with violating the restraining order, stalking, trespassing, and a lot of other stuff that were eventually discovered that weren't involved with the relationship turmoil. I haven't heard or seen from him since, but it's safe to assume he's currently in jail. Jade and I remained friends after this. Michaela's doing well and has since graduated from community college in 2021, and she's currently attending university four hours away from our hometown. I got to help Michaela in looking for different art programs for her both in-state and out-of-state, and she was offered scholarships to the university where she attends now. She hasn't dated since, and she wants to keep it that way. This all happened to my mother when I was just a baby. Before my mom married my dad, she had dated a man named Craig. At first he was sweet, but he slowly became abusive. My mom tried to leave him multiple times, but Craig always threatened her. After one violent argument, my mom waited and then fled in the middle of the night. Years had passed and she eventually got married and had me. My dad's work included a lot of traveling, so it was mostly just my mom and I alone in our big acreage home. My mom was in the kitchen making lasagna while I was sitting in my high chair. It was extremely hot that day, so she opened the kitchen door to let in some air. She heard heavy footsteps entering into the kitchen behind her. My excited mom assumed it was my dad, and she then turned around with a, hello my love, and her excitement immediately turned to horror. There was Craig standing in the middle of our kitchen with a gun visibly tucked into his pants. Craig smiled at her and asked what she was making. My mom mustered enough courage and she told him it was lasagna. She was physically shaking as Craig sat himself down beside me. He playfully pinched my cheek and my baby self just laughed at him. 
My mom was holding back tears as she finally asked him what he was doing in the house. Craig then said that he just wanted to visit my mom and that he would leave when he was done eating. When the lasagna was ready, she had to serve him some. My mom took me and then sat across from Craig so she could keep an eye on him. Craig said he still had her things at his house and she was welcome any time to come get them. My mom said she didn't need any of it though and he could throw it out. Craig started to get agitated and he said that she threw him away like the garbage too. Craig said she was acting tough but that he knew deep down inside she was still the stupid girl he dated. Craig claimed that my mom needed him in her life and that she couldn't function if he wasn't there to help her. He said he needed to be there to raise me because my dad was a loser who would never be able to protect my mom or I. Craig said if he was crazy, he could have easily kidnapped us or done things to my mom because my dad was a pussy who couldn't protect what was his. My mom started to cry and she told Craig to leave the house. Craig said that it wasn't her house and that he had every right to be there. My mom then said if he didn't leave, she would call the police, which really made him angry. Craig then threatened if the cops got involved, he would hire men to cut her up into pieces and film it. My mom started to cry even louder, and an agitated Craig threw his plate, and then he yelled at her to stop crying and that he loved her. My baby self got scared and started to cry too, which then caused Craig to stand up and approach my mom. She jumped out of her chair with me cradled in her arms, and she then begged for Craig to spare my life. Craig tried to reach over to touch my mom, but she got so scared that she fell to the floor, sobbing. The phone began to ring, and Craig became so overwhelmed that he ran out of the house. The cops and his own family found him about to shoot himself in the head. His adult son had to convince him not to do it. My mom was just so traumatized that she didn't want to deal with any of it, so she got a restraining order against him. Her and my dad then moved across the country. I was curious, and I decided to search this guy up, and I was absolutely shocked to see that he was dating a college-aged girl who looked just like the woman he couldn't have. He really was fucking insane. So before I begin on this next story, I just wanted to mention that this isn't exactly a crazy ex story, but I still felt like it fit the general theme and topic of this video. Major Trigger Warning for Sexual Assault I would like to remain anonymous, and I'm going to be changing his name to avoid him finding out that I shared this story. I will also send screenshots and photos to verify the story, but I don't want them shared publicly. The story is very long. I'll refer to him as John. I met this man when I was around 16, and I became friends with him. That is, until he became obsessed with me, and I stopped talking to him because he was scaring me. I've recently found out that he's been lying to me about how old he was back then, and that he at the time was 26 years old, and he had also lied about his name to avoid me being able to identify him to law enforcement, or so I'm assuming. So now I'm almost 30, and I hadn't heard from John in years. I went out for one of my friend's birthdays about a year ago, and she wanted to go to a club. I don't dance, so I was kind of just hanging out awkwardly on the balcony of the club and having a drink. And all of a sudden, I started feeling really out of it. I also want to mention that I'd only had one drink, and I fell down. I don't really remember very much after that, but I woke up in a random motel with blood all over my legs, and no one else was there. For a few days, I didn't know what happened, until John started sending text messages, saying that he had a really good night with me, and he started saying that we were in a relationship now, and that he couldn't wait for the baby to get here. I then realized that my blood had come from my IUD being pulled out of me that night. I can only assume that he somehow got into my phone and got my phone number the night he assaulted me, because we hadn't spoken in years, and I had a new number. John proceeded to message me every day on different phone numbers, and he would call me 50 plus times a day for months trying to figure out if I was pregnant. But because he never admitted to assaulting me, 
the police told me they couldn't arrest him without proof, and I still didn't know his real name at this time. One night, though, my best friend came over to my house to spend the night, and then right after she left, a woman was kidnapped right in front of my house. Later that day, John had messaged my best friend on a Facebook account with a fake name, and then said, So, what were you two doing last night? I went to the police and I showed them a photo, as well as the messages he sent to her, and they again said that wasn't proof and that he didn't do anything wrong. The harassment continued to the point that I actually had to change jobs because I was so scared that he was going to show up in my work and try to kidnap me. Well, about a month after the kidnapping, John had started calling me around midnight over and over. I then heard something at one of my windows and I realized that he was trying to break into my house. I called my best friend and the police, and he left when he heard me on the phone with the police. And he called the police as well, saying that I was his ex-girlfriend, and that he had left a gun in my house that he wanted back. He started sending messages, saying things like, Can I please have my stuff back? And, I don't know why you're acting like you're scared of me, because we had a really good relationship. The police showed up to my house, and I showed them the messages. The police officer texted him from my phone to not contact my number anymore, and they found a loaded gun right outside of my house. He had already left, and he gave the police the same fake name. The messages and calls stopped for about a month after this incident. That is, until I started receiving gifts on my porch. They came with notes attached, telling me how sorry he was that he caused us to break up and how all he wanted to be was my child's dad and husband one day. He then messaged my best friend again, asking her if she would help us get back together, and that if he keeps messaging me, if I'll keep getting mad at him. I ended up finding out his real name, and I found multiple charges for assaulting women and kidnapping, amongst other things. The police have told me my only option at this point is to get a restraining order, but no one knows where this man lives, and he doesn't have a job, so it's going to be almost impossible to find him, and that it's not illegal for him to be in my neighborhood or to send messages, because he hasn't been served a no-contact order. I'll be sure to provide an update if anything else happens in the future. I was 19 when this happened. I'm a female, if that matters. I live in the UK, and it was 2018, beginning of May, just before that awful soupy heat was here to stick around. I was working late, and I had made it home around 10.30 p.m. I decided that I wanted some snacks and something more exciting for dinner than just pasta, so I headed to Tesco at about 11 p.m., which is just over a mile up the road. I had been doing this for years without ever coming close to the fright that I felt on this day. I had gone to the cash machine the day before too, and therefore I had around 160 pounds on my person. My mom was borrowing her dad's car at the time. He loved this car, and my mom was pretty protective of it since it was her dad's, and it was also parked outside of the gates, but still on the driveway. It's a double driveway, so the cars can park bumper to bumper, but there's big double gates in between. I was making a bit of noise getting my bike out from the shed, so I didn't hear it at first. Then there it was, singing. I frowned. It sounded close. I opened the gate and got my bike through safely. The singing was turning into shouting, and then quite obviously a drunk slurring of words. I snapped my head to the left, and sure enough, a man about 25 years of age leaning up against said car. It was honestly quite jarring to see him that close. I was on the other side of the car luckily, but I hopped on my bike and sped the hell out of there. I pulled out my phone and I rung my stepmom, telling her all about the guy leaning up against the car and how he seemed drunk. Now, it wasn't really out of the ordinary to come across drunk people when there was just a pub over up the road especially but also we're extremely close to the town center, and this was a Saturday night. I asked her to just let mom know, and she can sort it out if she wants. 
I was still on the phone when I pulled up to a roundabout that I would have had to cross over to get where I was going. So I do just that. I pull up and stop, look to my right for vehicles, and that's when I see something out of the corner of my eye. I almost dropped my phone because there was absolutely nowhere for this man to have come from, and he didn't make a single sound. He was on a bike too, which is the first thing that I noticed. He looked to be around my height, six foot, though he could have been taller. He was mostly sat down. His eyes, skin, and hair were all dark, as well as the clothes he was wearing. So it was hard to get a good judge of age since it was completely dark out too. I would say that he looked around early to mid-twenties. In typical British fashion, I then said, You alright? And I did that stupid smile thing you do to strangers. Do you live close to here? His voice was a bit quiet, but other than that, it was ordinary. My stomach was doing somersaults. Yeah, not too far. Why? Of course, I was about 90 seconds from my house on my bike. Less if I put some effort into it. I frowned, not really sure what was happening. Oh, well, you just look lost. That's all. I frowned even harder because I certainly didn't look lost. I mean, I was clearly on the phone, having a conversation that had nothing to do with directions. And if I had Google Maps open, why would my phone be up to the side of my face? My mind raced with the possibilities of where he could have come from, and how I hadn't heard him approach me until he was three feet away. There's only one place that I can think of. Not in the moment, but looking back. My house is part of a row of houses, and at the far end of the row furthest from my house is a trail. It's not very long and it just leads around the back of some industrial buildings and the local rubbish tip. But there wasn't so much as the moonlight to light your way down there. He could have easily been in hiding waiting for the next person. It just so happened to be me. So I replied, Um, nope. <laughs> Not lost. I laughed awkwardly, then gestured to my phone, wanting to just get back to my conversation. He bids me good night and crosses the road ahead of me, and I watch as he then crosses again, and goes and sits down at the bus stop. Now at first, I'm pretty relieved. Okay, he's just catching the bus. Chill out. But then when I realized what bus stop he was at, my heart sank even more. The thing about this stop was that Tesco was its last stop, and it actually would have taken him less time to get there on his bike than it would have if he waited for the bus to even get there. The bus then loops back around and goes down the same road to go along its route back to the town center. There was no reason for him to be stopped there. I didn't know it at the time, but I have autism. So if you're wondering why I didn't just go home, it was because I had already set in my mind to this plan, and nothing was going to stop me from executing those plans. Also, because I'm autistic, I tend to be nonverbal in high anxiety inducing situations. This will be relevant shortly. I got off the phone with my stepmom, and I rang my boyfriend at the time, now X. I was telling him that I was just popping to Tesco, and also what it was I had planned for dinner, and I was just catching up with him. I cycle past this guy on the other side of the road, and I mentioned to my boyfriend that I think I'm being followed. Well, he tells me I'm not, and that I'm being dramatic. I looked back, and sure enough, he was on his fucking bike. He was gaining speed, so he was cycling alongside me on the other side of the road, and within seconds he was ahead of me. I could not yet breathe a sigh of relief because this man then turns to the right, crosses the road, and then heads back for me. I tell this to my boyfriend who simply thinks that there isn't even another person around. My hands are now sweaty. My mind starts whirling with possibilities. If he just wants to rob me, then great. He can have my money, my phone, whatever. I just didn't want to be hurt. Of course, I've completely clammed up, gone nonverbal, and I'm now a stuttering mess. I'm barely making any sense to my boyfriend who's on the phone. The guy starts talking to me. How old are you? His voice was exactly the same. It was quiet, calm. 19 was all I managed to say. Oh, cool. Me too. 
I've just moved to the area. I nodded. I didn't know what else to say. I couldn't say anything. He had positioned his bike so that I was unable to get past his with mine. My boyfriend was still on the other end of the phone, growing annoyed because I wasn't talking to him. Was this guy going to stab me? Were his friends going to jump out and grab me? Pull me into their grubby van? Was this a gang initiation? Was he just a maniac? I was freaking out to say the least. I honestly have such a hazy memory of the events from here on out. Where are you heading? He asked, as he was now getting closer, but he hadn't gotten off his bike. The shops, I said. This wasn't a lie, but I wanted him to know that I was headed to safety and possibly a security guard. Do you think we can be friends? He asked me. I was stunned, but I didn't want to annoy this guy, obviously. I was saved from answering. My phone started ringing. It was my boyfriend. Somehow we had gotten disconnected. Well, I better head off. I might see you around if you just moved here. I said. I beamed a smile, snapped out of my days, and simply answered my phone call. By some miracle, he nods and heads off in the direction we've both just come from. I vomit a little, while gathering my composure to grab my handlebars to stop my hands from shaking. What a weird night. I had to listen to my boyfriend believe that I had lied about going to Tesco, and that instead I had gone to see another boy because he had heard me talking to someone with a male voice. He was just as insane as this guy. I did end up breaking up with him a couple of months later. This and so many other things led to it. I eventually did make it to Tesco where I promptly rang my best friend at the time and bawled my eyes out. A quick message from my mom told me the drunk guy leaning against the car had left. He had apparently been picked up by some girls in a Mini Cooper and then whisked away into the night. I made it home, terrified the whole time I was going to encounter this weirdo again, but luckily I didn't. I couldn't help but feel for a long time then the two instances were related and this was just way too weird for this to not only have happened on the same night, but also within literal seconds of each other. This probably doesn't even seem that scary compared to other stories on this channel, but it sure did scare the shit out of me at the time. It all happened so quickly, possibly 10 minutes, definitely no more than 15. I wanted the ground to swallow me up or someone to just come and save me, but in the end, I was really lucky I wasn't hurt. It didn't stop me from doing my nightly Tesco trips forever though, only a week or two. I'm now 25, and the memory of that night is something that I just don't think I'll ever forget. I remember how I felt at the time, way too strongly to ever put this to the back of my mind forever, and it's felt really good to talk about it. I grew up in a small southern Illinois town of a population of about 2,000 or less, where everyone knew everyone. It was a fairly safe town where I felt comfortable enough to walk the streets at night alone, and I often even hitchhiked to wherever I needed to go as a teen. Because of this, I was very trusting of others, which hadn't really been a problem until I graduated and began working in a nearby city. I worked at a Walmart, and since I had just begun in the electronics section, I got the shift none of the others wanted. That's right, I got the closing shift. Walmart itself didn't close at the time, but I would be the last electronics associate to leave, so I was left with the duty of closing down the photo lab and cleaning up the department. Since it was a high theft area, there were supposed to be two of us closing, but more often than not, I was alone. One day I closed the department alone once again. It was late at night and no one else was in the parking lot aside from the man sitting on the ledge of the store playing a guitar. As I walked past him, I noticed he looked obviously homeless, and I decided I'd stop and listen to him play for a moment, and then give him whatever spare money I had on me. Reaching in my pocket, I remembered my then-boyfriend, now-husband, had taken all the change and small bills out of my wallet and had put them in a change jar, and in fear of being rude with nothing to give him for his talent, I just continued walking to my car. 
Once my back had been turned to him for about five feet, I had heard the guitar stop playing and get sat down. I peeked behind me, and I then noticed that he was now slowly walking in my direction. I made sure to have my keys ready in my hand, unlocking the door, and getting ready to relock it as soon as I got inside. I walked faster now, and soon, the man was right behind me. Luckily, I reached my car, and I got inside, then locking it. He then wandered around, acting like he was just chasing me moments ago. I thought maybe that I overreacted, and I just went home forgetting all about the man completely. The next day I come in, and one of my co-workers then asked me, Hey, did you see that man yesterday that was walking around the store with the guitar? I told her that I had seen him outside after work. Well, the next thing I know, she's holding her phone right in front of me, showing me a mugshot of the man. Sometime after my encounter, the police had actually arrested him. He had apparently hitchhiked across America, raping and murdering several women. He was a serial rapist and a murderer, and I would have been his last victim if my husband hadn't put my money in a change jar, and if I hadn't made it to my car in time. Since then, I've learned how to navigate the city, making sure that I only park near cameras, and if I have to walk alone at night, I call someone while I walk. I'm going to be sharing a story that completely changed me. Me and my two friends decided to go outside one evening. I'm going to call my best friend V, and my other friend I'll refer to as Jay. Well, we all decided to start exploring our town. It's really big, and you can easily get lost, but that's not the case in this story. I, being the youngest, was 14, while my other two friends were 15. We were wandering around the streets having conversations for a while. After what seemed like a while, we eventually got tired and began to walk home. We must have been out there for a while because the sun was just starting to set. We were about a mile and a half away from our street. This is when things started to get weird. We started to cross the main highway and we noticed someone following us. It was a Hispanic male and he looked to be about five foot four. Me and V noticed him instantly, but we couldn't really assume anything because he could just be trying to get across. We then turned down this back street heading the direction of our neighborhood. The street in question was really narrow, and it was a one-way street. There wasn't any sidewalks either, and unless you wanted to walk in someone's yard, you had to walk on the street. The street is on a hill too, so it isn't easy to run up it. He also turned on the same street. Now is a good time to say that I'm a boy, and I look exactly like a girl. I have long black hair that I always keep up in a bun. Also, being with two other girls makes no one even look twice at me to realize I'm a boy. Anyways, so the guy continues following us. He went as far as speeding up and then switching the sides of the street to where he was walking in front of us as slow as possible. This had really freaked out V and I, and instantly we started laughing to cope with the fact that this was so fucking weird. My other friend didn't know anything because she had her AirPods in, and she was on her phone walking. We then switched the sides of the street and started speed walking. We then hit the end of the corner, and me and my two friends started walking down the street that V lived on. At this point, he was now behind us on the other side of the street. V and I turned around, and we saw him staring there by the light. He was starting to wave at us. We were now about 15 yards away from him. Immediately, he then started speed walking towards us. It had kind of stunned us for a second, and V started to fake a phone call from her mom. We very obviously started brisk walking down the street. At this point, we were now about 20 houses away from V's house. We then heard the overwhelming sounds of footsteps slamming on the pavement right behind us as if someone was running. V and I didn't even look back. We just started running. I turned behind us to call out to our other friend behind us to also start running because she had no idea what was going on. I then saw the man laughing while he was running after us. 
we eventually finally got to V's right in front of her house, only to look back and not see him anymore. We all just stood on our porch kind of just laughing about everything that happened, only to then see the man walking down the street as he had returned. I then felt my stomach drop, and then we all went inside to tell her mother. Her mother came out, and the man was just standing under the streetlight right across the street. Her mom then started yelling at him, asking why the hell he was following her children. He didn't say anything back in return, and he actually had the audacity to lean on someone's gate. This is when we all realized that this man had intentions of truly following us, but as for his plans, I don't know. He continued walking down the street a little bit more and just stood there. V's mom continued to yell at him. At this point, V ran inside and she also got her stepdad to come out. Once her stepdad came outside, he then instantly walked down the street, all while me and V then yelled at him. Jay and I eventually got a ride home from V's stepdad. No one ended up calling the police though. Yeah. I still can't believe it. We eventually got on FaceTime together, just talking about everything that happened, and we were all still very much in shock. V's mom made a Facebook post about it, but nothing else really happened. I still to this day think it's so fucked up that no one suggested calling the police, but I'm just glad none of us got hurt. I don't know where that man is or what his plans were, but I really hope we don't see him again. My mother was the type of person who really depended on no one. That was until she had to have both of her legs amputated. She lived on social security, and she was not a rich woman. When she came home from rehabilitation, my brother and I had to find someone to help her get up and ready in the morning and also to put her to bed. She was fine during the day with her trusted wheelchair. My brother worked weird hours with the railroad, and I lived far away, so we were of no help. Luckily, she had a neighbor who was a caregiver, and had offered her services for $15 an hour. She did this professionally, and I couldn't believe our good luck. I would call my mother daily to check up on her, and she seemed to be just fine. One morning I had called, and she was crying, and she said that the caregiver's husband had been there that morning and tried to kiss her, and that he made her lie naked for a very long time, and it was cold. I told my mother how could that be true? Who would be trying to kiss an 80-year-old amputee? I also didn't hire an unexperienced man to take care of my mother. I called the woman, and she said she had an emergency, and that she had to have her husband come over and help her. I told the woman what my mom had told me, and she and I agreed that maybe my mother had some dementia. She said that her husband would never do that, especially to a woman in her 80s with no legs. My mother then told me that she didn't want them in her house ever again. Then the woman quit on us the next day with no warning. I think she must have known he was a pervert. Maybe she was too. I unfortunately am very ashamed to admit that I didn't do any background checks. The next time I visited, I had went to their house to pay them what we owed them. This was the first time I had met the husband. The husband would not make any eye contact with me. I left with the feeling that my mother was probably right. Well, later in the year, the next time I visited, I heard that he was in jail for molesting his wife's granddaughters who were still in diapers. I will never ever stop feeling guilty for not believing my mother. Who the hell knows what he actually did to her? Did he drug her and molest her too? Did he go through her stuff? Did he try on her clothes? I hope that perverted bastard rots in jail or the fellow prisoners hear what he did to the little girls and old women and give him a taste of his own medicine. I grew up living in rural Vermont. We had lived on a mountain road and there was a field behind our house that I often played. There were also woods on the far edge of the field and if you went through them, this would take you to another field. The entire thing was fenced in as cows were placed inside each summer. 
The field was owned by a local farmer. I often played with the cows, and I had also followed them through their various paths in the woods. One day when I was around 12 years old, I was playing in the woods as normal, and I was riding on the back of one of the cows. She ambled slowly along, and I just casually rode along eating some blackberries that I had picked. She headed down a trail in the woods that I knew would bring us out of a clearing that I'd really enjoyed sitting in. When we popped out, I glanced over at the fence as it bordered the property of one of our neighbors. This man had always made me nervous. His hair was tangled into one big mass of a knot, and he smelled horrible. Unfortunately, he was outside in his yard, and he spotted me immediately. Now, he didn't own that field or the cows, so I wasn't too bothered. I just got down off the cow's back and began to poke around in the berry patch. Suddenly, I heard the twang of barbed wire fencing then being strained. I looked back, and the man was climbing over with a rifle. I quickly ran into the woods to hide, thinking he wouldn't follow me, but he did. I could hear the sounds of sticks cracking as he pursued me. I ducked under some branches to catch my breath, and I sat quietly as I could as my ears strained. He was definitely still out there, but I still had a lead on him. I knew that there was a spot a little further up where I could climb under the fence and then come out on the road. I made a break for it, and I climbed out of the pasture quickly. Once I was on the road, I stopped to look backwards, assuming I was now safe. The man stepped out of the woods, and he stood there pointing his gun right at me. I thought that I was going to die right on the spot. I then slowly walked backwards, watching him the entire time. Right in that moment, a vehicle came around the corner, and when I then turned to look at who it was as they drove by, I turned back to the man, and he was gone. I avoided that pasture for a very long time after that. I'm a 21-year-old male, and my girlfriend is 20. We rented out an apartment for a month. The area was secluded, and after dark, everyone would really just mind their own business. The neighbors would hardly even talk to each other, or even be outside in the evening. Our apartment was in a building with four floors, and each floor had a single apartment. All of the apartments were very compact and built to be rented to students. The night that we moved in, our taps ran out of water, so I had went upstairs hoping to borrow some from the people living upstairs. I had realized that two out of the four apartments were vacant, and they were also locked. The apartment on the fourth floor was lit from the inside, so I decided to ring the bell, but to my disappointment, nobody answered. Over the next week, we had gotten used to hearing the sound of someone whacking a rod or some sort of metal on maybe the floor, or some other object. This would start late at night, after 1.30 a.m., and then continue for hours. Initially, we didn't really care about it, but after some time, it got us intrigued. The sound was clearly from one of the apartments above us, but as I already mentioned, two of the three apartments were vacant for sure, and the third one seemed vacant as well. But as I said, it was lit from the inside. I knocked on its door many times, but no one ever answered. The whacking sound was a daily occurrence, and on some very late nights, we could hear someone climbing the building stairs. It seemed as if we were the only ones living in this building, especially during the day and until the very late nights. We had made up theories just to try and convince ourselves that it was nothing but the pattern of the whacking was way too irregular for it to be made by wind or something other than a person. It would start almost daily at around the same time. We had asked people around, but we didn't get any satisfactory answer. No one knew if anyone lived there. Towards the end of our stay, I saw a shady looking man going upstairs during the day. I asked him if he was the owner of the apartments upstairs. He said that he was, also including the one on the fourth floor. I asked him if anyone lived upstairs, 
and also about the strange whacking sound. He told me that no one did and that he's actually looking for tenants. He also said that he had no idea about the sound. To my surprise, he then asked me, So how long are you going to stay here? Four more days. We're actually leaving on the 30th of this month. I replied. He asked me if anyone else had rented the place for the next month, and I told him that I didn't know. The strangest part is that for the next four days, there was neither the whacking sound nor the sound of someone climbing up the stairs late at night. However, my girlfriend's internship got extended by two days, and we decided to stay there. And just as I had anticipated, the whacking sound resumed after the 30th, the day we were supposed to leave. I don't know what it was, I don't think I'll ever know, but I'm just happy that we got out of that place without any crazy consequences. It really freaked me out sometimes, and I even feel weird thinking about it, even now. This truly frightening story occurred more than a decade ago, just when I was about to head into my teenage years. My friend and I were wandering around in the neighborhood I was living in, as we always did. We had strayed several blocks from the house we were staying at, when two dogs started barking up a storm at us as we passed their house. They were pit bulls. The dogs were digging around the ground under their fence, where it was clear it had been a place they had escaped before. We could tell the dogs were about to break out, so my friend and I started running. As we saw the dogs get up under the gate and start coming at us, we went into this person's yard, and we shimmied up a tree which had branches for us to get up on. The dogs are now at the base of the tree barking, which made the owner of the yard we were in come out and then shoot the dogs away. As we were still in the tree, the owner, which looked to be about 50 years old, then started telling us to get into his garage so he could keep us safe. My friend and I just looked at each other, knowing between our eyes this was danger. We proceeded to tell him that we were okay and we were going to head home. But he was at the base of the tree at this point, attempting to coax us into letting him help us down. The tone and mannerisms in the sky were truly sinister, and even as young boys, we could tell he was a predator. The man kept looking back and forth on the street, just to make sure that nobody was watching this go down. But eventually someone walking their own dog down the road came along, and I said that was my relative. We jumped down as the man backed up, and we then ran up to this person like we knew them. I always wonder what would have happened if we had actually let the man keep us safe. This happened in 2019, and I no longer have any contact with this person. When my husband and I lived in our first apartment together, I didn't have a job. We had just moved to a new city, and I had had some trouble finding anything. Naturally, I was at home because of this. Every day at the same time, I would walk my dog Remy. She's a seven-year-old female dog. We would always walk the same route in front of the leasing office across the street, by the basketball courts and by the tennis courts before walking the rest of the property of the apartment complex. The first encounter I had with this guy gave me tons of red flags, and I reported him to the leasing office because of his behavior. As I was walking Remy back home, the man who looks like he was in his 40s, glasses and gray hair, was walking from the basketball courts to the sidewalk. I stopped with Remy because she was going to try and jump on him if she got close enough. He noticed us, and he then asked, Is she aggressive? I replied back to him with, No, she'll just jump. I know some people don't like dogs or dogs jumping on them. He looked me up and down, staring at my chest for a second. Then he asked if he could pet her. I said sure because Remy's tail was going a million miles an hour and she was also whining to meet a new person. He started to talk to me while petting Remy. My name's Joe. I just moved across the street. What's your dog's name? I was nice to him. Enough though I had a weird feeling while talking to him. This is Remy. I'm Megan. Fake name, by the way. 
I live next to the groundskeeper with my fiance. You'll like it here. The staff are awesome. The entire time I was talking, he was petting Remy and staring at my chest. Joe thanked me for letting him pet my dog, then turned around to leave. I was weirded out, but I brushed it off, and I just told myself that it was probably nothing. I walked Remy the rest of the way home, but I noticed that Joe had went into the entrance of his apartment building, but he was watching me walk home through the glass. I then hightailed it the rest of the walk to my apartment. It freaked me out enough that I called the leasing office and I told him that Joe was watching me walk home after meeting me and that I was generally uncomfortable with him. I also had them come fix the blinds in our dining room because I didn't want anyone looking inside our apartment. After I loaded myself into the car and drove to my mother-in-law's house, I then just stayed there until my now husband got home. Anytime I walked Remy and eventually Peach as well, who was my other dog, Joe was always somehow outside when I was. He always tried to come talk to me or pet the dogs. Luckily, whenever I would walk Peach, she would growl at him. She was and still is very protective of me. If I ever walked the dogs with my husband, he would never come talk to me. It was only if I was alone with Remy or if I was just alone. He would also start walking by the front of our apartment whenever my husband wasn't home. He would try to look through the sliding door to get a glimpse of me. My husband and I decided to move into a bigger apartment because we really needed more space for the dogs as well as ourselves. The day I got the keys for our new apartment just down the street, I had yet another experience with Joe that made me call the cops. I was walking both of the dogs around the block so that I could finish up some last minute packing. I saw Joe pull into the complex in his car. I stopped to let him go past me, but he had waved me to cross the road. When I did cross, he pulled around really fast with his window already rolled down. Hey Megan, I was just wondering, are you really happy with your husband? If not, I can help you out. He looked me up and down, then gave me a wink. I acted like I didn't even hear him since I had headphones in. I just immediately went inside and locked the door behind me. I then called the leasing office and I told them what happened. I also let them know that I was going to call the cops and at least make a report because his behavior was really freaking me out and I wanted to at least have it documented. I called the non-emergency line and an officer came out. I told him what happened that day and some of the creepy behavior Joe had before. The cop asked me, do you want me to give him a warning to not talk to you? And I told him yes. I thanked the officer for his time after he took my name and my phone number down, and he then went to the leasing office to talk to the staff about the situation. About an hour after the cop left, he gave me a call. He told me that he talked with the property manager of my apartment, and he also ran Joe's license plate number. He told me his name, and he told me that the leasing office has said that he's had other complaints from other tenants on file as well. He also mentioned that he didn't get the chance to talk to him because Joe was leaving as the cop arrived at the leasing office. I thanked him again for his time, and I finished packing. I decided to go to the leasing office to talk to the property manager just to clear up anything just in case. When I got there, the manager told me that Joe had multiple reports just like the officer told me. She also told me that she was going to have our on-site officer to stop and try and talk to him and also encourage him not to talk to me or any other female residents. I thanked her, and I went home to start moving little things until my husband got home. I went almost six months without another incident with Joe. We moved to the third floor, and he didn't have any idea which apartment was us, so he wouldn't bother us. I also made it a point to have the dogs on a certain schedule, so I would never run into him when we were out. The last time Joe tried to talk to me, I just turned around and I walked away. I didn't let him get a word in. I also noticed him harassing my neighbor outside while she was grilling one day. I told the leasing office about it just in case. Well, a couple of months later, he ended up moving out because they wouldn't let him resign his lease. And that's the last I saw of Joe. 
I always carried a stun gun with me whenever I walked the dogs or by myself because of him. I was fully prepared to shock his ass a couple times if he ever got close enough after I called the cops on him. Thankfully though, that never had to happen. To start this off, I'm a 25 year old female and when the story took place I was 18, about to be 19 in a few months. Me and my now ex had met through mutual friends right before I turned 18. We had hit it off pretty quick and when I moved to my first apartment, he was given a key since he lived near and it was kind of a smart idea. Months had passed and I became very busy with work. I worked as a waitress in this popular restaurant in our city in the height of summer. AKA a lot of get togethers and such were held at the restaurant. So naturally, there was a lot of overtime, especially at late nights. I had always taken the train home from work and on that day, I had left my phone in my locker as usual. While on the train, I had opened up my phone and I saw 133 missed calls and more than 200 text messages from him. I tried to call him back, but he didn't answer. His texts made no sense whatsoever. They were almost hysterical, like I had gone missing or something. I always informed the people closest to me my work shifts just in case they wanted to visit or such, so it wasn't that he didn't know where I was. As I arrived home, it was pretty much bright because it was summertime and I saw him sitting on my damn couch. He then stood up, just walked right past me and out of my apartment. It was very odd, and I had called my best friend to tell her about it. Some more time passed, and I was now turning 19. Me and my now ex moved in together, which turned out to be a huge mistake. After the previous incident, he had acted all normal, and we didn't even speak of it at all, even though I tried to bring it up on multiple occasions. We lived an okay life, that is until he got fired from his job. He went mental. At that point in the relationship, I had noticed many red flags and I was planning on leaving soon. I was waiting on my next paycheck to come first, but after he lost his job, his drinking went out of hand to the point that when I got paid, this sorry son of a bitch stole over $280 out of my savings. I had my savings in a physical box that I kept hidden where I would from time to time put some extra money in. When I found out about this, and when I asked, he had actually lied to me for days before one of his friends reached out and told me what happened to the money. I was devastated, but I knew there was no way I could get it back, and on that same day, I broke up with him. When I said that I wanted to end things, he was really quiet, and he just went to sleep. I was really happy since he seemed to take it okay. Right around that time, I had also met this wonderful man, who for the sake of the story we'll call Max. Me and Max hit it off even better, and we started hanging out every weekend. I still did live with my now ex, but I didn't bother bringing this up to him, since he was pretty much drunk 24-7 and he had taken out a heavy loan to pay for his drinking, of course saying that it was a loan to pay for his new car but I know that was total bullshit. I had kept a physical diary that I kept in my nightstand. It was always in there and I never left it out. But one day when I got out of work, I got a call. So he finds my diary and now he accuses me of cheating, which again wasn't even true since we had been done for a while now. At that moment, luckily a weekend came and I went to go hang out with Max. But things had escalated from there to the point that I had to stop eating and Max had luckily let me stay with him until I could find a new apartment. It took a while, but on one evening, me and Max were driving back to his place from a shop. When my ex called me, saying he had forgotten his keys home and if I could come and open up the door for him. I agreed since we were nearby and he said that I couldn't bring Max though. I entered the house joking with my ex slightly about the forgotten key as I opened the door, and I went to get some more of my stuff from the house. Then when I was about to leave the headroom, my ex just stood at the door and demanded that I stay with him and give him my keys. The only reason that I hadn't given him my keys yet was because all of my stuff was still there. 
and my family and I were going to go there and move them out in a week. I said no, and that I was leaving now. He blocked my entrance, and once again, he punched me in the face. Baffled, I called Max. For context, my ex was about five foot seven and very slim, whilst Max is about six foot three and muscular. As you can imagine, this had spooked out my ex quite a bit, but not enough for him to move the hell out of my way. My face was hurting a lot, but I knew that he wasn't done with me, and that I had to leave now. While on the call with Max, I once again told him no, and I pushed him roughly out of my way, just enough for me to get out. But as I was at the front door quickly leaving, I saw my ex walking towards me with a damn kitchen knife. I don't think I've ever been so afraid before in my life. I quickly opened the door and then slammed it shut. Then I ran down the stairs to Max's car. I then quickly get inside and shut the door before telling him to leave really quick and then explaining to him what just happened. Max was horrified and he suggested that I call my mom about this, which I did. Now, she had known about this whole thing for a while, but this had made her fear for me even more at that point. The week went by, but not without constant calling and texting. At one point he called me like 20 times in one day, and he even sent me messages of him cutting his wrists and blaming me for it. When the moving day came, oh boy was he all over the place. Max had come along to help with my family, which included my mom, my stepdad, my older brother, and Max stayed downstairs just in case. But apparently that wasn't enough for this dude. He went all ballistic about it, and he threatened to kill me. Luckily, nothing actually happened, and we successfully moved everything out of there. But that didn't stop his insane harassment. He had sent some of his friends to stalk me at work and such. And how do I know this, you may ask? Well, it's because I saw one of them, and I straight up asked why he was there. And this particular friend told me. The friend and I became friends when me and my ex were still dating, so he knew both sides of everything, and what happened. I confronted my ex with this info, and he denied it, and he went on to continue to send me messages all throughout the day, as well as calling me constantly. Then I blocked him. I really wish that this was the end of the story, but it's not. Me and Max later moved in together when I was about 21, right after we had been dating for almost two years, when he then came up again. By this point, we had moved in together a very long distance away from my ex, but he somehow found out where we lived, and he started to send some of his friends to come knock on my door in the middle of the night, sending me death threats through the mail, and much more. This continued for a few months, until one day we discovered that our dog, who back then was just a puppy, was barking at the window like crazy after we came home from a date night. We thought that she may have just been barking at some animal that she may have seen or something, and we just went to bed shortly after, since both of us had to wake up very early for work. Well, at about 2.30 a.m., we woke up to our dog barking again, but now she was barking towards our living room. We've always kept our bedroom door slightly open so that she could walk in and out whenever she wanted. I woke up Max, and he found it odd too, since she seemed to be staring at something in the living room. He got up, and I stood up from our bed as well to see what was happening, when Max then yelled, What the fuck are you doing in our house? And that's when I heard it. Footsteps that quickly turned into running steps, when Max luckily shut the door and then screamed at me to call 911. After about 10 minutes, the cops arrived, and we heard a loud commotion through our door and when one of the officers asked us to open it, I saw a face that I never wished to see again. It was my ex. We had to go to the police station, and we were told that he had gone through one of our windows. We lived on the first floor of our apartment building, and he had hit around the house and then actually waited for us to get back. The scariest part of all this was that he had a lot of bad stuff with him. He had a hunting knife duct tape, and a small handsaw as well. He was arrested that day, and he was given a sentence of two years for breaking and entering. In our country, the sentencing system is very broke, 
and people who do horrific things get surprisingly light sentences. I ended up placing a restraining order against him, and me, Max, and our puppy moved further away. But this story does have a happy ending. Me and Max got married last year, and just two months ago, I gave birth to our daughter. We live in a smaller town far away from my ex, and I really hope that I never have to see his sorry ass again. I'm a 31-year-old female from Germany, and this happened to me in 2014 during and shortly after my stay at a mental hospital. Before I begin this story, I need to give you some background information about me so that you can understand the state that I was in at the time. I was originally born in Bosnia, which is a small country in southeastern Europe for those who don't know, but came to Germany during the Bosnian War in the 90s. My father was a raging alcoholic back then, and he only married my mother for the little money she had, and he made it very clear that he preferred us far away from him. Years of mental and physical abuse, bullying at school, and also caring for my broken mother and older brother while maintaining the charade of the strong child made me a wreck, but I kept it all bottled up. Until the year of 2014, that is. After an especially nasty breakup paired with bullying at work, I finally exploded. Nervous breakdowns look different on everybody, but for me, it was spending my days crying without eating without sleeping or leaving the house until my mother finally noticed and got me hospitalized. I was later diagnosed with PTSD, major depression, and borderline personality disorder. Anyway, sorry for the long backstory, but I need people to understand that I was at my lowest, and therefore I didn't see the gigantic red flags this boy basically threw right in my face. Let's call him Kevin for the sake of the story. I met Kevin online during my second month in the hospital. He seemed like a nice guy at first, but our conversation soon got darker. He started telling me all about his problems, that he too suffered from depression and other mental illnesses, which was fine with me, and it even made him more attractive somehow. We texted a lot, and we got along great. At this point in my therapy, I was allowed to go home during the weekends, so Kevin and I decided to meet up the next weekend. In my vulnerable state, I really couldn't wait for that to happen. To my disappointment though, he had stopped replying as soon as I got home. I waited all day, but I heard nothing of him until the next day when I arrived back at the hospital. He basically just told me that he was sorry for making me wait, that he was very busy and whatnot. I checked in with the nurses and I went out to the little fenced yard that housed the animals like all the goats and rabbits for therapy purposes. It was 7 p.m. and it was already very dark outside, but I preferred a little privacy to reply. While texting, I had this uneasy feeling of being watched. Looking around, I couldn't see anything or anyone, but I heard a slight shuffling not too far away. I tried brushing it off as the animals just moving around but I was suddenly very aware of just how far away from anybody I was, so I headed back, followed by more strange noises I might add, which I ignored. So fast forward to about a week later to when Kevin and I finally met up. We had a good time. We talked a lot while sitting in my small apartment. He wasn't really giving off any strange vibes just yet. I mean, aside from the mysterious guy with mental health issues, you know, the ones which I liked, of course. We met every week from then on, and he even picked me up from the hospital a couple of times. At the end of my third month in the hospital, I was finally discharged, and I guess you can say I went back to my normal life, working full-time and taking care of my dog, Isaac. This was also the time when Kevin began to act strangely. It was pretty subtle at first, I would just catch him looking at me from the doorway after I left the room to get something from the kitchen. But soon, I would catch him peeking behind the shower curtain while I was in the shower. I told him to stop that, as it made me really uncomfortable. But still, somehow felt his presence while I was in the shower, or a stare while changing. He would also start to act really mean towards my dog. Isaac isn't a very social dog, and he usually ignores people mostly but Kevin would push him away in very unnecessary situations, like whenever he was heading towards me 
sometimes even insulting him, and even acting jealous. I tried to talk to him about all this, but he just brushed me off, like I was just imagining this strange change in his behavior. The final straw and nail in the coffin was the evening where Kevin told me that I should get rid of my dog, just so he could be the only one looking at me from then on. Yeah, strange, but I knew he was dead serious. At this point, I had enough of him, as well as his strange and creepy behavior. I tolerated it for a while out of fear of going through all this recovery alone, but now he was just making me uncomfortable, and I was honestly getting scared for my dog, as he was really giving off these bad vibes of bad intention, so I broke it off. He eventually left, and I felt a huge relief. It was like I escaped from some potentially dangerous situation. The stalking began around a month later. Every now and again, I would see his car parked near my work or my place, with no one inside. I was really just annoyed at first, but I started to get more anxious about it. I got the same feeling as the one I had when he would stand behind the shower curtain while I would walk home from work. I even saw him one time disappearing behind a corner. I knew it was him every time though, as Isaac would start growling in certain directions. But of course, I had no proof. So there was nothing I could do, and I just walked home as fast as possible. Also, he seemed to be relatively afraid of dogs, so I knew he would keep his distance, making it somewhat easier to endure. This all went on for almost a year, but it did eventually stop. Almost, at least. Years afterwards, I still got cryptic messages from him from time to time, but I never did see or feel his presence again. This was a long time ago but I still won't go anywhere without at least my dog by my side, even after moving far away from this creep. This isn't the scariest story you'll ever hear, but this also proves that there are some very, very crazy women out there. So I was around 10 years old at this time, and my dad was a few years sober now when he had met this crazy woman named Casey. They worked at the same job, helping each other become sober. My father and I's relationship was finally starting to get better, and he had an apartment, and I would come stay with him whenever I wasn't at my mom's. Casey lived in the complex next to his. I remember walking over to the dog park next to her apartment to meet her and her dog, and she seemed nice enough. She had started staying with us more and more, and I'm pretty sure she basically moved in at this point but still had her own apartment as well. One thing that always bothered me though, was that she always, and I mean always, cleaned my room for me, and I hated that. I'm an OCD type of person, and things have their spots, and I like my stuff a certain way, so that always made me angry. But anyways, time went on, and I found out that she was pregnant. I was actually really happy about it, but oftentimes I would see her smoking, and it really scared me because she was pregnant. As time went on, my father broke up with her, and I was really shocked and confused about it, but I was also still excited to have a little sibling. Well, a few weeks later, my dad got back with his ex that is now my stepmother, Ashley. Well, we did go, and we found out it was going to be a boy. The last time I hung out with Casey was when she took me to get ice cream. She had picked me up for my mom's, my father had no clue she did this, and he later made me block and delete her off my phone. She told me that she wanted to name the baby boy Asher, or something like that, but couldn't because it reminded her of Ashley. Now, this is when it gets fucking crazy. So, the last time we heard from Casey was when she had texted my father that she had lost the baby. We've never heard from her since. Basically, she said to my mother that my father had made her leave her job where she had met my dad because they shouldn't work together, which was total bullshit. She also said that my father never went to the doctor's appointments because he didn't want to or because he was too busy. But in reality, she never told him or didn't want him to go. And here's the craziest part. My dad wanted pictures of the sonogram, so she ended up sending him random looked up sonograms from the internet. So yeah, all in all, this lady traumatized a 10-year-old girl 
but also lied about being pregnant just to get back together with my father, which didn't even work. Casey, you're an absolutely terrible and manipulative person, and I think my dad really dodged a bullet by breaking up with you. I can't believe you lied about being pregnant. Who the fuck does that? I need to give a trigger warning for violent death and violence in this story. It's very graphic. I'm a guy from the UK, and I'm currently 23, but I was 18 years old at the time of this story. So my parents had bought me some concert tickets for this singer that I was super into, and all three of us were going to go together. It was in a different town than where we lived, so we had planned to get onto a train there and then stay at a hotel for the night. This being a pop singer, my dad wasn't all that interested in the concert, so he would have stayed at the hotel and then come to pick us up at the end of the show. So fast forward to the end of the week. Our plans were sort of interrupted when my sister said she was going away for the whole week with her family. She had originally told my parents all about this a while back, but they thought it was at a later date. This meant that my dad would have to stay home to look after our dog when we had originally planned for the dog to stay at my sister's house. So anyways, the day of the concert comes, and me and my mom travel down on the train. After looking around the city for a few hours and spending some time in our hotel, we had walked to the concert arena. Now to enter this building, you had to walk through these long wide tunnels, sort of like an underpass. These then lead to the foyer, where the merch stands were. I was expecting some sort of doorway with security to get inside, as that's what I experienced at previous concerts, so I felt slightly uneasy walking in. I half-jokingly, half-serious, then told my mom, Wow, man, literally anybody can just walk in here. There were doors which led to the concert hall from the foyer, and they had staff checking bags and tickets, though the bag check wasn't thorough at all. I had a large bag with merch that I had bought, and I opened it up. He literally just glanced at the item on top, and then said I could go through. We get some food, and I buy some merch. Then we head to our seats, which were maybe about 20 rows from the back. The concert was amazing. I'd been wanting to see this person live for about 7-8 to eight years at this point. The concert eventually ends, and everybody's getting up from their seats. I start walking down the steps to the exit, and all of a sudden, we hear this loud echoing boom. It sounded like a piece of equipment had fell over. The place fell silent for about a split second, and then screams had erupted, and people were now running in every direction. That's when I then heard a girl then say, gunshot. My heart sinks, and my instincts then told me to run back up towards the back of the building. My mom had shouted my name, and we both stood at the walkway at the very back of the arena. Now, I've been hearing increasing news stories about shootings in America, as well as the Pulse nightclub shooting that happened nine months prior to this event. I was imagining a gunman running through and blasting everyone to smithereens. I then thought to myself, Okay, I can hide behind this railing and nobody will see me. At least, that's what I was hoping. A man then said through the microphone not to panic, everybody safe, and to please leave in an orderly manner. The place slowly clears out, but me and my mom stay where we are just until things calm down a little. A woman with three children who looked to be around the ages of 7 to 10 came up to us, and they asked if we knew what was going on. Right around this time, a worker from the area told us to please leave, and that we're safe. I don't think she really knew what the hell was happening at the time, but she was just following instructions to clear the building. My mom then replied back with, Uh, no. We'll leave when we feel it's safe. After some time, the arena's pretty empty by this point, and we finally head down the steps to exit. I happen to see a girl on a lower seating level. I think she's lying on the ground or she's on the chair, and I then see a paramedic beside her. I'm pretty sure she's been trampled on. My heart's still racing at this point, and I'm still thinking that there's actually a possibility I could die here. I didn't outwardly panic though, 
and I was trying to stay calm. I partly wanted to be a strong man for my mom, but I also feel as though I'm very level-headed and also good in a crisis. I play a lot of video games and I've read a lot of crazy stories. I'm also very paranoid, so I'm always thinking to myself, if a certain event happens, this is how I'm getting out of it. I'm the kind of guy that always sits next to the exits on the bus or trains just in case of an emergency. But I gotta be honest, I never thought something like this would happen though. Anyways, my mom is slowly looking around at this point. We're being told to move on, and I see this girl. My heart is pounding. I knew that we had to get out, and I'm trying to convince my mom that we need to go. We link arms, and we walk out the exit. Going down the steps and through the exit, I see a thin cloud of gray smoke, and there's a horrible smell. I look to my left, and I see this big chunk of what appears to be a mangled torso of a human. It was all bloody, but with no head or limbs. As I was looking at it, a staff member appears, placing a cloth over the top of it. My mom sees this as well, and she grips my arm even harder, and we walk faster. There's a fire exit door that's open, and we're being ushered outside with another group of people. We finally get out, and we walk as quick as we can to try and get away from all the other people. I was then told to call my dad. I really don't remember exactly what my mom said on the phone to my dad. Something about there being an accident, but that we were alright and safe. We had held back for a while, maybe around 30 minutes, so it must have been around 11pm when we got outside. It was pitch black, we were in a new city, and we didn't know where the hell we were. We just knew that we had to get as far away as possible. We turned the corner, and an ambulance sped right past us. I almost walked right into it. We were actually speed walking for a while, my heart still pounding. We were in the middle of the city. We'd exchanged a few words with each other, as well as passerbys wondering what the fuck was happening. I started to suggest that we should walk back to the hotel, but my mom didn't really feel safe doing so in the dark, so she eventually flagged down a taxi. I was really hesitant to get in that car at first, but we did end up getting safely dropped off at our hotel. As soon as we got to the hotel, we put the news on the TV immediately. So here's what happened. Apparently a bomb had been detonated and a bunch of people had died at the concert. We didn't learn everything and all the details straight away. We tried to sleep. I actually slept in the double bed with my mom. I was way too panicked to sleep alone in my single. I think I got maybe about a half an hour of sleep. We ended up keeping the news on all night, watching the whole story unfold up until the morning. My full body was totally shaking, and we both had to constantly keep going to the bathroom. There were fire trucks and ambulances constantly speeding past our hotel window. I was looking on Twitter, and everybody was talking about what had happened. I couldn't believe it was world news. There were YouTubers, celebrities, and friends from England and America and all over talking about the events. There were missing people posters being posted, and I just kept refreshing my timeline to find if there was anything new. As I said before, it was very early in the morning, maybe around 6.30 to 7 a.m., which was right around the time we went down and tried to eat breakfast, but I couldn't eat. I was wearing a hoodie I'd bought that night with the singer's face on, so everybody that saw me was staring at me and giving me sympathetic looks. Our train tickets were for around 10 to 11 a.m., but the people at the train station luckily let us get on the next one to our city. I think we got home at around 9 to 10 a.m. We didn't want to stay longer than we had to. Me and my mom were still on edge, and we were pretty much suspicious of every guy on the train with a backpack. We arrived at our home station, and there were armed police officers with the biggest guns I've ever seen in my life, like those ones you see outside of Downing Street in London. Now, for all the Americans listening to this, armed police is not something you ever see outside of London, so this was very shocking. 
It honestly showed just how real this shit was. I finally felt a little bit safer now that I was in my city and that there was armed police. We got home and we put on the news again, just to see if we could find out any more new information. We found out that a suicide bomber had detonated a bomb in the middle of the foyer, which was right below where me and my mom were sat at, and it was just as the concert was ending. 22 people were killed, and many more injured. Four were killed from my city. If the bomb was any stronger, or if the evil bastard waited any longer to detonate, we too could have been blown up. We watched the footage of that night of people running down the stairs, as well as all of the paramedics carrying people to the ambulance on railings, as there weren't enough stretchers available for some reason. I guess they just weren't prepared for such an event. But I also wanted to mention, that mangled corpse that I saw on the ground, that was the suicide bomber. And the smoke was from the bomb. And the bad smell? Yeah, that was from all of the people that had been blown up. I still get chills thinking about the fact that as soon as I walked into that building, my instincts told me that something wasn't right. If my dad had went with us, he would have been standing at that foyer at the end of the night, waiting for us to come out. And if it weren't for my dog, my dad would be dead right now, or seriously injured. I truly believe that my dog saved my dad that night, and that he was truly never meant to come with us. We got our dog when I was very little, we grew up together. He actually died a few years back at the age of 16. We continued watching the news about the victims and their families. Memorials and such were held, and we watched. I don't think I left my bed for about a whole week, besides for the toilet and food, as my body was just in such shock. It just didn't feel real. I later got free tickets to a fundraiser event that they were doing about a week or two later. I really wanted to go, but I was way too scared to attend a concert so soon, just in case it happened again. I was already a very anxious person, but my anxiety and paranoia was through the roof for a good couple of years after that event. If anybody put a bag or suitcase on the floor or walked away from it, I would always panic. I probably had some sort of PTSD, and I also found it hard to play violent or scary video games for a long time. It's been over five years now. I rarely think about the events of that night now, and I now have very little anxiety compared to what I used to have. If you want to know more about that night, just Google Ariana Grande Manchester bombing. It was a huge deal. You really never think something like this will happen to you. I never thought I'd ever be involved in a terrorist attack. That's just stuff from the TV. But the truth is, it happened. And it truly was horrifying. I'm going to be going by the name K for my safety. This happened in 2018. My mom had a very long battle with drug addiction and making poor decisions. She was married at least three times, and her third marriage was to a hell's angel. I'm not sure if you all know who they are or not but they're a very dangerous biker gang here in California. They're known for crimes like drug dealing, trafficking and stolen goods, gun running, extortion, as well as prostitution operations. From my knowledge behind the scenes, also murder. Anyway, I always hated this man. For the story, I'll call him Jay. Jay would purposely antagonize me and try to make me angry because he knew that I hated him. He was very physically and mentally abusive to my mom, and he even went as far as to break her cheekbone once. She wouldn't go to the hospital for this injury, because he wouldn't allow her to, due to his inability to get any more strikes for physical violence, or else he'd go back to prison. Well, on May 3rd, 2018, I got a text from my mom, who was supposed to be clean at this time. She was rambling on about how she was going to leave Jay, and how she would never hurt herself and that if anything bad happened to her, I needed to know that it was someone else that did it, and she would never do anything to hurt herself. She also told me not to text that number again, because it was Jay's phone, and she had to give it back to him. She told me she would be in touch once she got away and got a new phone. At this point, I'm just thinking that she's probably just strung out on another bench, 
and she had no idea what she's talking about. Now, as a child of a drug addict mother, I'm really used to different numbers for each call or text, as well as the occasional disappearance for months at a time. But on May 8th, 2018, I found myself sitting in the kitchen having lunch with my roommate when my phone rings, only to see Jay's name appear on my screen. I didn't know what I was expecting, but I immediately felt sick because I really hated him and I didn't care to hear his voice, but something had pushed me to answer. When I did answer, I heard this fake ass pathetic sad voice over the phone telling me my mother's dead now and that it was an overdose. I fell to the floor, crying and screaming. Another thing I want to add, as a child of a drug addicted parent, it feels like you're always waiting for that call, but when you finally do get it, it hurts way more than you ever could have imagined. As time goes on, I'm contacted by an investigator who I didn't share any information with. As months after my mom's death, I found out I was pregnant. It wasn't just me anymore. I also had my new baby to think about, and the Hells Angels aren't anyone you want to mess with. So to keep myself and my baby safe, I decided to keep this information all to myself, but I did still keep all the texts from her leading up to this event. I later found out that all the drugs in her system were actually all prescriptions that belonged to Jay. I'm not sure if I'll ever actually know what happened to my mother, but either way, my children will never know their grandmother, and for that, I hate them more now than I ever did before. The story happened in 2018. It was 4.30 p.m. on a sunny Friday afternoon. I was going to the city that night to hang out with friends as I occasionally did. My dad dropped me off at the train station and I walked towards the platform. While I was walking the short distance, I realized that there was a number of people standing outside of the station, which usually meant that the train was canceled and that we'd have to get to a bus instead. But just to make sure that was the case, I walked into the start of the platform and towards the middle where all of the information boards were. The platforms on both sides were completely empty, which was pretty unusual for this time of the day. I can't remember what the information boards actually said, but it probably didn't explain why everyone was outside. I was confused now, and I walked back outside of the station. There were absolutely no announcement for delays, cancellations, or bus replacements, so I looked around at the people all standing about trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I don't remember when all these things happened, but police cars then began showing up. There were at least five of them and two or three ambulances. There was also a middle-aged woman talking to a police officer. She appeared shaken, though I didn't know why. Then, I heard her say, I, I really don't know how to explain it. He just jumped right in front of it. At this, I started to realize something bad had happened. I realized somebody had probably jumped right in front of a train. I got there probably only a minute or two after it happened. I finally got the courage to ask a couple of teenagers, Hey, do you guys know what happened here? One of them confirmed it was what I had thought. Someone jumped in front of a train. What looked like detectives then showed up after a while, dressed in black and holding folders and paperwork. There was also a detective taking photographs of the train tracks where I'd walked past just before so I had unknowingly walked past what was certainly a ghastly sight of a dead body that had just been hit by a train. I'm honestly surprised that nobody stopped me from walking onto the platform. I never heard about this incident on the news, maybe because of some laws regarding reporting suicides. I don't know. In any case, I'm glad that I didn't look onto the train tracks, because I just know seeing that would have really scarred me for life. This happened a few months ago when me and my mother went to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee for a three-day Christmas getaway. We had a great time at the first hotel, which was like a Christmas fantasy land. There were cookies and hot cocoa every night in the sitting area on the first floor. There was also instrumental Christmas music playing softly all day and night, 
all throughout the halls, and there were also decorated floors. It was honestly a place that I would want to live in. I even joked to my mom, saying to her, Yeah, let's just not go back home and see if they rent the rooms for a whole year. I mean, we could probably afford it, and I'll get a job working the front desk. My mom laughed, and she then replied back to me with, While it would be nice to live in a Christmas-themed hotel forever, I really hate the cold air, and I don't want to spend every freezing day outside to have a smoke break. Besides, I'd really miss our home in Florida a lot more if that was the case. The second day we left this hotel, and we went to another. It was way less fancy. It wasn't as pretty as the first one. It was run down, had chipping paint, and a lot of weird people. Like, it seemed like there were druggies and homeless people. We were on the third floor, though, so that made me feel good. I thought that we would be safe from any of the freaks and creeps below. Oh, how wrong I was. We had to get our boarding passes to walk home the next day, and my mom was really tired from walking around downtown all afternoon. So I offered to go to the lobby and print out the boarding passes on the hotel's computer and printer setup. She agreed, but before I left, she had gave me her pocket knife for protection, and she told me the way to open it if someone tried anything. She also handed me some money to get some snacks and soda for the morning, right before we'd go to the airport. I took the hotel room key, and I journeyed down the elevator to the doors that led to the outside. I saw a large black man on the corner, and he was smoking. I didn't pay him any attention. I just walked into the parking lot to avoid him. What happened next still gives me the creeps. The man then said, Damn girl, you look fine as hell. I'd really love a piece of that fine ass. His voice startled me, and I jerked my head to look at him. It was in the dimly lit light, and he was looking straight at me with a very creepy smile on his face. I rolled my eyes and just walked on, then muttering, what a creep, under my breath. I printed out the boarding passes at the lobby's computer, and after grabbing them from the printer, I looked at the doors leaning outside to where I was sure the creeper still was. I swallowed hard and walked out, and before anyone asks me, why didn't your mom do it herself? Or why not ask someone in the lobby to escort you to the back? Well, one, my mom isn't really good with computers, and two, the lobby was deserted, safe for me. I started to trek back when I saw the same creepy guy. I tried to ignore him, but I then heard him follow me. He was saying really disgusting things like, Hey, come here, baby girl. Daddy wants a piece of that little white ass. Come on, baby. Let me show you a good time. I panicked, but I then remembered the knife, and I spun around pulling it out, and then flicking the blade out, now screaming. Buzz the fuck off before I make you look like Freddy Krueger. Or worse. I'm not afraid of you. Leave me the fuck alone. He paused and back away, before then walking off, then muttering under his breath. <laughs> You're lost, bitch. I ran all the way back to my room, telling my mom everything. She phoned the front desk furious, and they just blew her off, saying it wasn't their problem. The police weren't much help either. They said that unless the man actually tried anything, there really wasn't much they could do. We went to bed, but my mom told me to keep the blade just in case. The next morning, we got on our lift to the airport. Our driver's name was Jamal, and when the car pulled up, I saw the same creepy guy from the night before. My mom said to get in the passenger seat, and I froze. Are you kidding me? Sit up front with the creepy pervert? No way! I did so anyway because we were running behind though, and we didn't want to miss the flight. Jamal looked really happy for this seating arrangement, and as we drove, he literally profusely missed turns for the airport. He began making very disgusting remarks and gestures towards me, all while looking at me and licking his lips. My mom was disgusted, but kept quiet. Not me, though. Very fed up, I had showed him the blade in my pocket, and I then said in a sweet tone, Sir, we're going to miss our flight. Please hurry. He looked at me with a furious glare, 
but complied. After we finally got to the airport, my mom handed him a $10 bill for the tip, and he looked at it in disgust, saying, That's it? That's all I fucking get? My mom just nodded, wishing him a Merry Christmas, before hustling me into the airport. We made it to our flight, and got back home. So, you're not gonna believe this. Apparently, this man showed up on the news, and he had apparently picked up two other girls right after us, and he raped and killed the both of them. He ended up getting arrested and caught, but I don't really know what else happened as far as getting convicted. To think that he might have done the same thing to me either that night in the parking lot or on the drive to the airport. I'm so glad that my mom gave me that blade. At the time of the story, I had just turned 21. I'm a female, and I was raised by a very conservative Christian family in the Bible Belt. As such, I was incredibly naive, and I seemed younger than my age. I also had been abused at 14, and I've heard some mental health experts say that in some capacities, you stop developing after a trauma, and you can get stuck mentally or emotionally at that same age for a period of time. Let me backtrack though. When I say I was sheltered, I mean that I was homeschooled my entire life. I only had two friends ever come to my house growing up, and each one only came to visit the one time. I became so introverted and timid that I couldn't get a job for almost two years after high school because of the level of anxiety I felt from filling out applications was ridiculous. And interviews. I couldn't even make myself do them. Eventually, I got my first job at a daycare. I'm the oldest in my family, so caring for kids was a natural thing for me. I really loved it, but I made a lot of first-time job mistakes where coworkers were concerned. I was there for around two years part-time before I realized if I didn't quit, the other ladies would continue trying to get me fired, so I started looking for the next thing. Through some of my mom's homeschooling friends, we had met a lady from the States. Her name was Miss V, and she was living in Germany with her three kids. An 11-year-old who'll go by Yim, 9-year-old by N, and 8-year-old K. We had did a few Skype interviews, and she told me she was looking for an au pair, so that she could transition from a stay-at-home mom to pursuing her career, which was a big part of them moving from the States. Mr. V had a job that would keep him away for months at a time, so in essence, she was a single mom. Looking back now and now having been a single mom of two myself, I can say that I have a little more compassion and understanding for her, but at the same time, I was young, and all of my experience was either with my siblings who were very well behaved and quiet children just like myself, or with kids considerably younger. But when she offered me the position, I accepted it, mainly just because my parents wanted me to so badly, and I could tell that they wanted me out of the house and learn to be more independent, and they didn't know how to help me anymore. I'm very much a people pleaser and an empath, so when I could see how badly they wanted this, I ignored the bad feeling I had on it, and I took the position, despite the fact that they were only willing to pay me $200 a month for around the clock babysitting for their kids. It was supposed to only be a six-month contract, pending a visa extension once I got there. Considering I went from not being able to drive myself to an interview because my nerves were so bad, to then flying for over 12 hours away in a matter of months, to say this was a huge step for me was an understatement. When I got there, everything seemed okay at first. I met the kids and they seemed really excited to have a new nanny. The mom I found incredibly hard to read, and honestly at that point we didn't really have much common ground, so exchanges with her were a bit awkward. I assumed there would be a little period of time where I would get to know her a little better, and soon be able to make decisions the same way she would. If she was home with the kids, I couldn't have been more wrong. I noticed early on that she was telling me all the time, you can't believe a word they say, the kids lie. But when I would tell her something they did when I walked them to her from school or an after-school class, she would believe the children over me. 
Growing up in a conservative household, I never had alcohol before, and the kids and her thought that it was funny and proceeded to drink wine in front of me. They did this regularly, even the eight-year-old kid. Not like a full glass or anything, but she would steal her mom's wine glass and cup as much down as she could before her mom would then chase her away. One time when her mom had gone out of town for a job for about a week, I went to meet the kids at the bus stop closest to the train station so that we could ride the train into the neighboring town for the kids' ballet lessons. When the bus stopped, Kay got off, and the bus doors closed and then pulled away. I immediately asked where N and M were. She told me that they had left a second-story window open and that they had planned to hop the six-foot wooden fence, climb outside of the house and onto the second-story balcony, then climb onto the window and watch TV all day long instead of going to their ballet class, since they knew I couldn't leave the eight-year-old by herself in another town to go pick them up. This was the kind of thing I dealt with on the daily. These kids were wild, and they were pushing every button they could, as well as testing all of my limits, and when I would try to be firm with them and send them punishments, their mom would come along and then believe the child over me and take back the punishments. I ended up being the bad guy who everything got blamed on in the household. By my second month there, I was silently crying every time I took a shower as hard as I've ever cried in my life. Because they were only paying me around $200 a month and the exchange rate was bad, in addition to everything being more expensive in Germany, I was burning through my savings very fast. Granted, I was doing some souvenir shopping on the two days I had off that I was allowed in the three months I was there. I remember being so stressed and not knowing how to fix the dynamics that had developed and whenever I would call home, my family couldn't understand why I was so stressed and unhappy. Eventually, I got the courage to tell Miss Fee that I wanted to leave and that the kids hated me. She yelled at me regularly because somehow every time they misbehaved, it was my fault for not managing them better. Of course, how are you supposed to manage kids when you're not allowed to punish in any way or when you try to force the punishment, the mom takes it away? When I told her this just wasn't working and that I wasn't a good fit for their family or lifestyle, she said something along the lines of, we had a verbal contract that you'd be here for six months. You're not leaving earlier than that. Since my parents didn't understand the level of stress I was under and how bad things have gone, bad enough that I had to stop eating three meals a day and that I was only eating one meal because I was afraid of not having enough money to get transportation out of there if it came to that, I just knew I couldn't ask them for help. I wanted to run away and get a ticket back to the States. But I didn't speak any German, and I was unaware that you could translate web pages into other languages, so I thought I couldn't even do it online without being able to read German. Miraculously, my visa never came through to stay in the country as a tourist, since they had told me to get a tourist visa, and not an au pair visa, because our agreement didn't constitute what was legally permitted in Germany for an au pair because of how little they paid me. Red flag number one that I majorly missed. So it's now the three month mark. Mr. V was able to come home for the first time and he tried his hardest to get buddy buddy with me. He tried to convince me to stay in the week he was there and I'm scared to say that it almost worked. Because of my abuse at 14 years old, I'm fairly easily swayed by older men's opinions and approval. He tried to act like a father figure to me and when that didn't work, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what he was trying, but something about it felt very unnatural, and that scared me just enough to swear for the first time in my life. I then stood up for myself, and I told them I was going to leave without their help, at which point he then said, since you broke our contract, you have to pay us back the $1,000 plus for the tickets I got you, or I won't help you book a ticket back. And the last ditch effort to change my mind Miss V then said, Are you sure your parents will even let you come back? That's a lot of money to spend without asking them. To which I responded, It's my own money that I earned from my part-time job before this. I guess the takeaway from this is that not all scary stories involve kidnappings and murders. You can also be traumatized by trusting the wrong people, by taking a job and leaving the country. 
I walked away from this experience, but that doesn't mean that I don't have scars. I developed an unhealthy relationship with food because of starving myself so that I'd have enough money to leave the country. I couldn't work with kids for a while, which was my passion. I didn't trust women because of the physiological abuse from yelling and mind games that that mom inflicted on me, and I had dealt with a lot of anxiety and depression in the past, but I developed suicidal tendencies that have plagued my life ever since. It's been nine years, and I'm still working through all the trauma with a therapist. Be careful out there. Warning. The story mentions attempted murder. This call wasn't mine, but a former co-worker's that I will never forget. I was a 911 dispatcher for a short period of time, and I've heard a lot of terrible calls. But this one particular call made me leave the industry. I worked in a smallish, but most would call extremely safe town, where crime rate happened, but people would still feel safe sleeping with their doors unlocked. It's grown over the last few years, which unfortunately so is the crime rate, but I would still consider it one of the safest places to live in my state. I remember I was on the day crew that month, and throughout the whole day we were getting pretty rough calls, from break-ins to carjackings to several car accidents. It was just an all-around rough day for all of us. My shift was from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. half the week, and the night shift was from 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. I left my work shift with my final call of a car accident with multiple severe injuries. I was so glad to go home and take a hot bath to unwind. I went to bed around 5 p.m. to get up for my 3 a.m. shift the following morning. I remember walking into work with a feeling of tension to the roof. I automatically knew something was wrong. As soon as I sat down to get all my stuff set up for the day, my coworker who I was relieving was just silent staring into space. That's when I knew she was the one who took the call. It was around 2 in the morning when a 911 call dropped into her ear. Screams flooded the line and what sounded like a domestic dispute happening. She quickly got the location pinged and then sent officers out. The line disconnects. As she frantically calls the line back, she gets a woman on the other line, crying hysterically. He killed my babies! He killed my babies! And I'm next! Throughout the screams and sobs, gunshots were heard, and the line goes silent. Officers rushed to the scene, where they found two children, both with severe gunshot wounds, and a woman barely hanging on to life, as well as a deceased man. EMTs and officers rushed the woman and the children to the hospital, where they then realized just how bad the gunshot wounds truly were. One child was shot in the face, and the other child was shot in the chest two times, both clinging on to life. The woman was shot in the chest, back, and leg, and was put on life support. The father was the culprit, who ultimately committed suicide. My co-worker leaving with tears in her eyes, not knowing if she had heard the family's last words is what still haunts me to this day. Several days later, my supervisor got a call from one of the officers who said both children and mother were 90% going to make it, but with life-altering injuries. I remember crying at my desk hearing that news, but I knew that day was going to change my life forever. I quit two weeks later. To all of the dispatchers, police officers, EMTs, nurses, doctors, and every other first responder, thank you for your hard work and dedication to your jobs. People really don't give you enough credit. And to that father who attempted to kill his whole family for unknown reasons, I really hope you're enjoying your nightmare. One night, my friends wanted to get together to hang out and play games. My best friend Alexis was dating someone I knew from high school, and his name was Jason. He invited his best friend Carter over, and Alexis and I invited our close friend Cameron too. Cameron invited his sister-in-law Brittany over. They arrived together excited to play Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64 with us. While everyone was getting settled in, 
Jason was prepping snacks and drinks for us. He realized that we needed a few things from the store, so we decided to take an adventure out to the gas station that was a couple of blocks away. While we were there, Cameron bought a few drinks and Jason bought a lighter. As soon as we settled into Jason's house, he was telling us that his roommate had gotten him into trouble. Jason had a cat, which he had left with his mom while he was figuring things out with his roommate. His roommate's cat and his cat weren't getting along, causing a dispute between them. He shared that his roommate Jennifer walked into his room one day to complain about the cats. He waved her off, and then she started hitting him on the back. Out of reaction, he then confessed he hit her back. He didn't go into more detail. Admittedly, I wasn't okay with his actions, and I sat in silence wondering how I should feel about that, especially because he was dating Alexis. Emily! Alexis called out. Um, yeah? I asked, breaking out from my thought. What do you want to drink? Alexis asked. Um, I'll have a Coke. I responded. Everyone sat in the living room just chatting. We were all sitting together in a full circle. Then there was a ring. Someone had rang the doorbell. A strange guy walks in. He says hi, walks into the kitchen, and he had mentioned something to Jason. Jason thanked him, and then the guy leaves. As Jason shuts the door, he then looks at us, letting us know that we can get anything we want from the kitchen. He sits and takes a sip of his drink. Right at this moment, I just knew something was going on. My house is broken glass outside. I'm not sure if you guys saw that when you walked to the gas station, Jason said. Yeah, I was about to ask about that, Brittany said. Well guys, there's more to the story than I shared about Jennifer, Jason said. You see, she had lined up home, telling him that I beat her. And yeah, I mean, I did hit her back, but come on, I didn't beat her. Today when I came back and I found glass around my house, I discovered that Paul broke the glass. He's under the impression that I threw stones and rocks at his house and stole his belongings. You see, that's impossible. As you all know, I was with my mom up north. It's a five hour drive. I don't know why this guy thinks that I broke into his house. And that's the other reason why I left my cat with my mom. We all looked at him with worry, especially Alexis. Do you think he'll come back? Alexis asked. I don't know. I'm glad you're all here though, Jason said. Don't worry bro, we got you, Cameron said. There were multiple loud bangs at the door. I wonder who that is, Jason asked followed by three more loud bangs. Jason opened the door, and it was Paul just standing there, looking deranged. Uh, what do you want, Paul? Let me in! Paul exclaimed. No, dude, you should go home, Jason said. I know you broke into my house today, Paul said. As this was happening, Cameron and Carter got up to stand next to Jason, ultimately scaring Paul away. Who the hell exactly is this Paul guy? Cameron asked. Jason explained that Paul was Jennifer's friend, that he was in love with her, but that she didn't reciprocate the feelings. Yeah, so Paul went to high school with Jason and I, I said. Well, that guy's crazy. There's something wrong with him, Carter said. I think we should call the cops, I said. Brittany nodded yes, and I looked at Alexis, and she nodded too. I grabbed my phone, and I was just about to dial 911, when suddenly, we then heard louder knocks at the door. This time Carter answered the door, and a strange man kicked in the door, startling Carter to strike him on the head. The girls quickly rushed to the corner of the living room holding each other, and Cameron gets up clenching his fists ready to swing at the third intruder. The third guy walks in, and he hits Cameron on the side with a bat, causing him to fall in pain on the couch. All of this was happening so fast that I ran into the kitchen, looking for mail to get the address of the house, 
as my phone was already ringing for 911. 911, what's your emergency? The operator asks. Please help us. Three strange men just kicked their way through my friend's house near Cutler Coy. Please send someone here soon. They have axes and bats. Please hurry. I tell the operator. Miss, I need you to calm down. What's the address? The operator asks. I'll let you know soon. I'm having a hard time finding the address. But I can tell you that we're near Health South. Two houses down that exact road. Please hurry. That's when I then saw Jason on the floor with his arms laid on the ground. And Paul was over him striking him on the head with an axe or some kind of machete. Then he was saying to him, Yeah, that's what you get for beating on women. And he was saying it repeatedly, but in Spanish. Oh shit, she's on the phone with the cops. Run, get the hell out of here. Paul yells. As they run, I see a white sedan-like car, possibly a Buick. And I tell the operator that they're driving away and that they're in a white car that resembles a Buick, similar to an officer's car. I quickly run to the door, locking it, then run to Jason. My heart then drops seeing Alexis crying. I rush to the closet, and I get towels, then handing them to her to see if she can wrap the wounds. Jason was all bloodied, his face covered with his own. Brittany, the bright girl that she is, also had an operator on the phone, and she was giving them the exact address. She braved it well. She then ran outside, got a piece of the mail, and gave the address to the dispatch. We locked the door again. Not too long after, there were three loud bangs, and this time it was the police. Police, open up! We're here. An ambulance is on its way. Please open the door. An officer said. I had checked the window to verify that it is indeed an officer. Then I look at Brittany, and I then wait for her to open the door. An officer walked in and asked us to step outside. I took a look to my right, and I saw Cameron on the couch groaning in pain. I also see Carter with his hand above his head, covering his head where the axe had hit him. Guys, I think I'm going to die here, Carter says. An officer walks over to me and leads me out of the house. I see paramedics and EMTs rushing to Carter, Cameron, and Jason. Alexis is still by Jason's side while crying. The officer asks for my phone and separates me from my friends. I see the other officers take away Brittany's phone too. I ask them to allow Alexis to go with Jason and the officer looks at me concerned. He asks me to follow him and he sits me in a squad car. As I sit down, I start yelling in fear, anxiety, anger, and concern and so many things all at once. I see the EMTs and paramedics taking Carter and Cameron in an ambulance. Then the officer sits in the squad car, and he says he needs to take me to the station for my statement. My mind was going a million miles a second while I was on the way to the police headquarters. I was wondering where Jason, Alexis, Brittany, Cameron, and Carter were at. I couldn't stop blaming myself for not calling faster and for not asking what Jason's address was before Paul ran through the door with the other two men. We arrived at the police headquarters, where the officer led me to an interview room. He walked in, with another officer asking me questions. They asked me what I saw, and if I could explain in detail what I remember. They asked me how I remember particular things. They asked how I knew the time of everything. I told them I had someone texting me multiple times throughout the night, and that's why I noticed the time. Then I also noticed the time when Jason had a strange man visit him, and that I had my phone ready to call 911 when Paul and the two other men he was with slammed through the door. So yeah, I was looking at my phone quite often throughout the night. The officers walked away for a while. Then they came back. They told me that Alexis, Brittany, Carter, and Cameron all said the same thing, and that all of our stories matched. That's when I asked. Officer, what about Jason? The officer's face went from focus to worry. Emily, you don't know? He asked. I know that when I saw Jason, he was bloodied on the floor, 
and that Alexis was trying to help him, and he was groaning. What happened, officer? Please tell me, I asked. Emily, we're so sorry to tell you this, but Jason died on the scene. Our paramedics and EMTs really tried to keep him alive, but he just couldn't hang on. Would you like to step outside for a moment? We didn't know that you didn't know. I could feel my face go from worry to pain. I walked in the women's restroom, washed my face, and then screamed. I couldn't stop wishing that I had called faster or asked for his address even earlier. I walked back to the interview room. The officers gave me back my phone and then asked if I needed a ride back to Jason's house. I agreed, and then I had an officer take me home. When I got there, Carter was there, Cameron and Brittany, and even Alexis were already there. I walked over to Alexis, and I couldn't let her go. I then hugged Carter, hugged Brittany, and then Cameron. Cameron had a huge bandage on his head. He said he was cleared after three hours. Guys, I said. They all looked at Jason's house, and that's when we saw all of the glass on the ground. We all just looked at each other in shock at just how much glass was surrounding the front. Then Carter offered everyone a ride home. We all got in his car, and then we agreed to stay in touch and talk to one another if we ever feel like we need support. Carter, on the other hand, said he needed time to himself, and I was the second to last to be dropped off. I hugged Alexis, then I asked Carter to check in. He didn't say anything. As I made my way to the door, my mom opened the door and asked where I had been. I told her everything. She immediately started crying. My brother walked out asking me if I was okay, and he also asked me what happened. I told both of them everything. At that moment, something eerie happened. My brother said that he and his friends wanted to go to CVS or Walgreens to get some drinks and snacks. So they walked and skateboarded over there around the same time Jason's house was invaded. While they made their way to a convenience store, a flock of blind cats surrounded them, getting closer and closer. My brother found it eerie. Suddenly the cats walked away, just as easily as they had appeared. When my brother told me this, I could feel a rush going through me. Today, Alexis is married to someone who was close friends with us. Brittany's living her life doing her own thing. Cameron has two kids and talks a lot about sports. As for Carter, I was told once that he changed and he isn't the same person anymore, but I'm not really sure in what way. When I met him, he was a very serious yet witty person. He's been really hard to reach since this all happened. We found out that the guy who visited Jason that day was one of his friends that he smoked with and that he had nothing to do with anything that happened. He was there by coincidence. This story has been altered a little and names have been changed. There's an article out there with a short description, but out of respect for my friends and their privacy, I'm not going to include it. Lastly, Paul was sentenced to death. His stepfather was sentenced to 14 years in jail and his cousin was sentenced to a few years in jail. A case was billed for Paul's cousin, and I went to court to testify against him. The jury decided to keep the sentence they had initially given him, though. They've all appealed to get a lesser sentence, but I'm not really sure of the status, but I haven't been subpoenaed since. This all happened back in 2012. It's been 11 years since then. I really only have a few words to say now. Rest in peace, Jason. I'm a 17-year-old female, and the story happened almost five years ago. I honestly remember it like it was yesterday. Now, I'm not the best writer in the world, and I'm kind of bad at explaining things, so I'll try my best to make this story as clear as possible and easy to understand. But first, let me give you the layout of my neighborhood. I live in a nice big neighborhood. It's safe, quiet, and nothing bad ever really happens here. The part of the neighborhood that my house is located at is opposite of a gas station slash convenience store, where a lot of people who are on the road a lot or that live around in the neighborhood 
buy snacks or whatever, as well as something for dinner, because there's a restaurant there. So it's basically like this. There's a main road that's facing in a vertical direction. Next to the main road on the right hand side is the gas station, and then opposite the gas station, also on the right hand side is my neighborhood. I hope that makes sense because it's an important note for the story. Anyway, let's get into the actual story now. It was the night of October 20th, 2018. It was a Saturday, and 13-year-old me was watching a TV show in the living room. At around 10 p.m., I had heard a loud crashing sound, which definitely sounded like a car crashing into another car. The sound of the car swerving after they crashed into one another gave me the chills. My mom and my sister both came out of their respective bedrooms, and I then asked them if they had heard the sound as well. Of course they did. I really don't know why I asked such a dumbass question. I think it's because I just didn't want to believe what I was hearing was real. I mean, I've never heard anything sound like that before. You could hear that crash from the depths of the ocean. That's how loud it was. I don't remember who said that we should go check it out, because the next thing I remember is the three of us walking out the door and then walking down the street to the gas station. It's about a one minute walk to the gas station, and on our way there, we saw a couple of our neighbors coming out of their houses and also heading in the same direction as us. As we cornered the street and approached the gas station, there was a horrible scene waiting for us. Yeah, you probably already know what I'm talking about. The car accident. There were two vehicles involved. It was some kind of white Toyota and then a smaller red car, which I don't know what kind it was. I don't know what the make of the red car was because it was impossible to tell because it was so badly damaged. As we stood there witnessing this accident that lay before us on the main road, almost everyone called the emergency services. Gas station employees, customers, neighbors, everyone. While all that was going on, I would asked my mom if I could run home real quick because I wanted to go fetch my three-month-old mini Doberman Pinscher. She was so tiny and I didn't want my baby to be alone at home because I knew it would be gone from home for quite a while. With my puppy in my arms, I locked the front door and I headed back to the gas station where both my mom and sister were still standing at. The police, ambulance, etc. were all there when I arrived. Now, let me tell you just exactly what happened on the road that night. It was pretty obvious to see what happened and what driver was the one that caused the accident. You didn't have to be a detective to know what happened. So, picture a vertical line with an arrowhead at the top. That's the main road. At the top of that line where the arrowhead is at, is where the white Toyota truck was facing, with its nose towards the red car at the bottom of the line. So, now the cars are facing each other, on opposite lanes, of course. The Toyota is going down, and the red car is going up the vertical line. In my country, we drive on the right-hand side of the road, so that's where the cars were positioned on their respective lanes. Anyway, the red car is driving at the appropriate speed limit, while the Toyota guy is driving like a fucking lunatic, thinking he's Vin Diesel. The red car is just about to turn into the right to the street that leads you past the gas station and then into the neighborhood. Well, as the red car is making the turn, Toyota guy crashed nose first into the left side of the red car causing both of the cars to forcefully turn into the opposite directions that they were originally going in. The people who were in the red car were a husband and wife, and they were killed on impact. Both of them had their seatbelts on. The husband was driving, and the wife was in the passenger seat. The Toyota guy was thrown out of his own truck after that forceful turn. The truck's driver's side door was open, and the dude was just lying face down on the sidewalk. It was so easy for him to fly out of the truck because he clearly didn't have his seatbelt on. We all thought he was dead. He was lying there unconscious for quite a while until he got right back up and walked back to his truck with a confused look on his face. He was so intoxicated that after even being violently thrown out of his own truck and landing on the sidewalk, the alcohol probably temporarily made him indestructible because that motherfucker was completely unscathed when he got up. 
His wide Toyota truck was also pretty indestructible, because there wasn't a single dent, scratch, or anything. Then there's the red car, that looked like a giant was kicking it around like a football. I can still remember when they covered the bodies with this foil-looking, sheet-looking thing. One of their lifeless hands wasn't covered, and there was blood dripping from the fingertips. The crimson red blood linking from underneath the car will forever play over and over inside my head. We found out by one of our neighbors who worked at the gas station that Mr. Toyota Man had a pregnant woman in the passenger seat. Yeah, she was fucking pregnant, and he wasn't even driving her to the hospital, so I'm not even sure why he drove that night. I guess the paramedics took her out of the truck because the passenger door was also open. I didn't even know she was in the car. I really hope she and that unborn baby were okay. After all that happened, my mom's sister and I and the puppy all walked back home. We got back home at around 1 a.m. The three of us all just decided to cuddle up together in my mom's bed, with the puppy too, of course. We didn't sleep that night, and I'm honestly surprised that my mom allowed the dog to lay on the bed with us. I shit you not, when my mom put on the TV, Final Destination was playing on one of the channels. I thought that was really ironic. The Toyota guy did end up being charged with drunken driving and culpable homicide, according to the articles in the local paper. If you don't know what that is, because I sure as hell didn't, I'll go ahead and explain. Culpable homicide, according to the law in my country, and thanks to Google, is an unlawful, negligent killing of another human being. There's different meanings of this that go more in depth that I'm not going to include here. I did some further research, and it's also a non-bailable charge, with imprisonment up to 10 years with or without a fine. I'm not really sure if he did end up going to prison, but he most definitely did if I had to guess. I only found out what he was charged with just a couple of days ago, when I had looked up the article of the accident to prove more information for my story. This experience showed me how neglectful your actions can drastically ruin your life and the lives of other people. How you can be living normal everyday life and have that life taken away from you in just the blink of an eye. My mom later told me that the deceased couple lived somewhere in our neighborhood and that's why they turned right. They were just driving home and they were so close. Rest in peace to the couple whose lives were taken so tragically. Stay safe everyone. And remember to think before you do something that could possibly ruin your life, as well as the lives of other people. And please everyone, don't drink and drive. My name is Corey. I'm 29 years old from Innisfil, Ontario, Canada, which is located about an hour north of Toronto, Ontario, around the region of Lake Simcoe. While the story may not be over horrifying in nature, I just hope that this story will send a clear message to those who get behind the wheel under the influence of alcohol or drugs. One mistake can change everything and can lead to life-changing consequences for those who are affected. The story takes place about 10 minutes away from me in Barrie, Ontario. It was December 1st, 2022. I had finished my shift at my regular job during the day as a custodian at my hometown elementary school. I also worked part-time with the Barry Colts, a junior hockey team for the Ontario Hockey League, or OHL. To better understand, it's essentially one of the three major junior hockey leagues in Canada where players would play to try and make it into the NHL. I basically would work some home games as the team mascot. On this night in particular, it was the Barry Colts facing one of their big-time rivals, the Owen Sound Attack. So from my house to the arena, it would probably take me about 15 to 20 minutes. So my route would be from my home in a subdivision, then onto a side road or back road, then take a ride on a major road that would take me through a small neighborhood town called Stroud. Then I'd take another left to another back road, then i get to the edge of the south end of Barry. I had took a shortcut to an industrial area where my dad works as a way to avoid all the major traffic volume, as around this area of Barrie, for those who know this area, it's one of the major streets in the city that connects to one of the busiest highways in Ontario, Highway 400 to be exact. 
It was the afternoon rush time traffic, and it can really be a bitch to get through if you're trying to get home. This area is also traffic heavy and pedestrian heavy around game nights, whenever the Barry Colts play their home games, where people would park their cars across the street and then walk to the arena, which is around 6.45 p.m. I approached a set of lights on the intersection of Bayview Street and Mapleview Street, waiting for the light to turn green. I then get a call from my buddy Adam, who works for the Berry Colts. Hey Corey, how far are you buddy? The fans are waiting in excitement for the Charlie Horse. Charlie Horse is the name of the mascot for the hockey team. I reply back. Yeah man, I'm right near the arena. I'm just waiting in the lights on Bayview and Mapleview. I'll be at the parking lot in like five minutes, I'd say. Okay, bud. Sounds good. See you soon. Adam said. And then at the exact moment as I ended the call with Adam, I heard this loud metal crunching sound that startled the shit out of me. My first initial thought was maybe a UPS truck that I saw driving past me going eastbound, and maybe they hit a bump, and the back door latched up, and parcels dropping. But it wasn't. I then looked at the corner of my eye, and I saw a blue and yellow Nike shoe flying towards me, and then hit the windshield of my Subaru WRX. Thankfully, no scratch, but as I looked towards my slide left, at a distance of maybe 25 to 30 meters away from me towards a gas station, my heart sank at what I witnessed, and I couldn't believe what I saw. There was a car accident that involved a Dodge Ram 2500, a Mazda 3 hatchback, and I believe a Chevy Trax. As I looked at the Dodge Ram near the traffic island, I had seen two people face down to the ground, not moving. It freaked the living fuck out of me, because it's the first time in my life that I've ever seen a car accident, as well as a real life person not moving in real time. I called 911, and I let them know what happened. I couldn't stay on the scene, as I needed to get into the arena to work for the hockey game. As I got to the arena, my mind was full of anxiety, because I still couldn't believe what just happened. Then I bumped into Adam. The conversation went as followed. Hey man, I don't know if you heard or not, but as soon as I got off the phone with you, there was a really bad accident on the turning lane to Mapleview. It was right outside of our arena. Three cars were involved, and two people hit. Holy shit, are you serious? I gotta notify the arena staff on this situation. That's literally two accidents outside the arena area in two weeks, Adam said. Two weeks prior to this incident, a man in his 70s was hit by accident in the same area just outside of the arena right after the hockey game was finished. He was walking across the street. Thankfully, however, he did survive. Traffic had to be rerouted after the hockey game was finished, as police, fire, and ambulance were on the scene overnight. I didn't hear any updates on that accident until the next day, and it was from an article on Facebook. From what I had seen on Facebook from our local news station, a woman in her early 30s was traveling towards the turning lane towards Mapleview, facing towards the highway. She then struck two vehicles, but she also struck three pedestrians, who are Special Olympic athletes, who are literally just walking their way down to see a hockey game. What was also noted too was that the woman who's a mother of two was driving under the influence of alcohol and crystal meth. The people that were hit had to be transported to Toronto via air ambulance. Despite the horrific experience and those who were involved, the victim survived and the woman was charged, and rightfully so. As I write this story, it's February 25th, 2022. The accident victims are making good recovery progress, and the woman's currently on trial for the car accident. That night in December still gives me shivers to this day, as it was truly shocking to see a moment of life and almost near death. Thank you all for listening to my story. I'm going to leave a couple of links for proof in the description. But please, people, please be smart behind the wheel. Don't fucking drink and drive, or get high and drive. This can really impact anyone you know or love. Life's too precious for something that makes a drastic impact in a matter of seconds. Please be safe. Our day had started just like normal. My fiance Sammy headed out to work 
and I'd also headed out to drop off our son Jordan off at my granny's. It was a 30 minute drive, as we all lived in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and my granny lived in Racine. I had got to work by 6.30 a.m., and I was working a double shift. At lunchtime, Sammy came into the restaurant to see his mom and I. He was supposed to work until 8 p.m. or so, and I told him I'd get Jordan after I got off work, and that I'd see him at home. It got busy, so I had to take some orders and do stuff. I remember him whispering to me, I love you, and I'll see you later, and I smiled at him. That was the last time I got to see him alive. 7 p.m. rolled around, and I got to be done early. I drove to pick up our son, only to find out Sam had gotten out of work early, and he had picked up the baby, trying to surprise me, I guess. We didn't have cell phones, by the way. Not reliable ones, anyway, in 2003. Granny made a comment that Jordan didn't want to go. She went on to tell me that Jordan threw an absolute fit when they were leaving, and how he just kept saying no. He was normally a very mild-mannered baby, and for him to not want to go with Sammy was extremely unusual. I headed home, expecting to find the boys, but instead, I was met with an empty house. It was around 9pm, and they still hadn't arrived. Sometime later, I received a call. It was that call, telling me there had been an accident, and that I needed to get to the hospital quickly. Before I could even leave, the phone rang again. It was Sammy's dad who was at another hospital with him. The doctors had him stabilized. They were waiting on the arrival of medical helicopter so he could be flied to a larger hospital in Milwaukee. Sammy's dad wanted me to tell Sammy I love you, as well as other things, because he thought that Sam would pass before I could get there. I was told that our son was at another hospital. I could hear ragged breathing and beeps in the background as his dad put the phone by him at some point. I said what I needed to. I hung up the phone numbly, trying to keep myself together because I still had our son to worry about. I drove to the hospital where our son was first. I don't remember feeling anything really. I got to Kenosha Medical Center in five minutes probably. I walked into the ER and I saw a cop that I went to school with. Our eyes met, and she then just said to me, Oh, Becca, I'm sorry. I was then pulled aside by her into a private room. She asked me to have a seat. I really don't remember if I sat down or not. They informed me that my fiancé and son were hit head-on, and then crashed into a guardrail by a wrong-way drunk driver who had his wife and two kids and a dog in the car with them. Sammy must have seen it coming. He tried to swerve, but where exactly can you go on a bridge that only has east and west lanes, and also over train tracks? His injuries were consistent of ones from bracing for impact, and also shielding the baby. Almost every bone in the right half of Sam's body was completely shattered, including most of his facial bones. Sam, having put the car seat in place correctly, kept our son in place. Our son's left leg was broken at the growth plate. The engine came into the front seat, breaking Sam's legs also, then pushing back the front seats into part of the back. I was told that the only thing left of the back seat was the small right corner where the car seat had been. Most of it had been ripped from around the baby, only leaving the front harness restraining him. The baby also had multiple cuts, gashes, and a broken orbital socket which tore part of his tear duct. The impact from the accident was so hard it shattered the baby food jars that were in the diaper bag in the trunk. A blanket in the truck was soaked in Sam's blood. CD shattered. I thank God every single day for the guardrail working the way it was intended to. Had it not been there or had it failed, our car would have fallen off the bridge to the train tracks, 75 feet below. The driver in the other car was killed, by the way. The wife and kid survived with severe injuries, eventually recovering. Our son Jordan has grown up fast. Well, it seems fast anyway. He's about to be 21, and he's serving his third year in the Army. He married his high school sweetheart Jessica back home here in Wisconsin on leave a year ago. They're expecting their first child, 
a daughter this summer. On the night we lost Sammy, I guess you could say I learned a few things. Always tell your family and friends that you love and appreciate them, because it only takes an instant for life to change. Back in the summer of 2020, I was at home playing video games with a buddy of mine when I realized I didn't have any booze left. Pretty much all I did during the pandemic was drink and play video games. Please don't judge me. Anyway, I decided to drive to the local gas station just a few minutes away from my house. As I walked into the gas station, I had noticed four men, four very large men and they were being very loud and obnoxious by the gas pumps. They must have been pretty drunk too, because they were being so rowdy, and two of them seemed to be stumbling around their truck. Now, this wasn't an abnormal sight, as my town's full of rednecks who drink way too much. Anyway, I went into the gas station, and I went over to the liquor section, and I had grabbed my choice of beverage. As I was grabbing my drink, the men had come in to pay for their gas, or whatever they were buying. The cashier was a young, attractive girl. She must have also been new because I frequented that gas station a lot, and I had never seen her there before. As the men were paying for their things, they had started to say very sexual things to the girl. I could tell it was making her uncomfortable. I won't repeat them, as they're just really not worth saying but they began asking her what time she got off and which car was hers. I could see that she was starting to shake and she could barely get the change out of the register. I really felt terrible for her and I then shouted, Hey, just pay for your things and leave. Now my mouth had acted before my brain could process that these men had not only outnumbered me, but they were almost twice my size. I'm a male and I'm about six feet tall and decently built, but if these men decided not to play nice with me, I stood no chance at all. After I blurted out for them to leave, they all turned and looked at me. It was then that I realized the situation that I had just put myself in, and my heart dropped into my stomach. By the pure grace of God, they simply shot a pissed off glance at me, nodded, and then left. I then approached the counter, asking the young girl if she was okay. She was still shaking, but she said yes. I asked her if she wanted me to call the police for her, but she said no, and that her manager was in the back. I just said okay, and I paid for my things. I looked out the window, and luckily the big rusty truck the men came from was now gone. I did a quick jog to my car making sure they weren't parked around the corner of the building, and they weren't. I was able to make it home to enjoy some drunken video games with my friends. So fellas, if you are ever in the position to stop sexual harassment, do it. Just make sure you aren't possibly going to get your ass kicked in the process. I'm a 29-year-old female but at the time of this incident, I was 19. It's not the scariest story in the world, but it definitely terrified me. Me and my now ex-husband were driving home from a friend's place, and we needed to stop for gas since we were running on E. The only problem is that since it was really late, around 2 a.m., there weren't too many gas stations open. We had to stop at one of the more run-down stores, that was in a bad area. As soon as we pulled up to the pump, I noticed a sketchy looking guy pacing in front of the store, talking on his cell phone. So when my ex-husband gets out of the car, I immediately lock the doors. I continue watching this guy because he's giving off some major bad vibes. And as soon as my ex-husband went into the store, the dude makes a beeline straight for our car. I almost pissed my pants when I saw him walking towards me so I lunged over the driver's seat to reach my taser, which was in the door. As soon as I grab the taser, I knock on the window, and I turn to see this guy standing there peering right in at me with a creepy smile on his face. So I roll down my window the tiniest bit, and he asks me if I can help him turn his phone on, 
to which I then reply with, I don't really think you need help with that. I literally just saw you talking on it. He tells me it turned off, and he asks if I can get out and just help him out really fast. Obviously, I told him no, and I told him to get away from me. But then he literally tries to yank open my door. I scream and I hold up the taser right in front of his face, and I start pressing the button down to show him I have a weapon and that I will fuck him up. Thankfully, he backed away from the car, and my ex-husband came out of the store soon afterwards. I was so terrified that I actually started crying while telling my ex-husband what happened. Of course, he wanted to confront the creep, but by that point, he had taken off. We didn't end up calling the police, but we did alert the store clerk, just so she knew about the guy. I'm very thankful nothing else bad happened, but things easily could have gotten a lot worse for me. To all the ladies out there, always be aware of your surroundings and stay safe. I'm an 18 year old female and my sister's 21. One day we decided that we wanted to take a weekend trip to Colorado on a whim. We decided that after I got off work, we would get on the road. On the day we decided to leave, I had worked from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., so by the time we had started driving, I was pretty tired, but my sister wasn't very comfortable driving at night, so I said that I would drive the full way there. We started driving from Albuquerque, New Mexico, so about three hours later, we got to Taos, New Mexico. We decided to take the back road so that I could pull over to sleep when I felt like I couldn't drive anymore. Once we got to Taos, I decided to start looking for a truck stop so that I can sleep because I felt like a truck stop would be the safest place for two young girls. We came upon a rundown truck stop that looked like it might have been abandoned. Since I had already been awake for around 15 hours, I decided that stopping there was the best option. Being that I had a broken car window and we were both young, my sister decided she would stay awake while I took a quick nap. After getting about as comfortable as you can get in the driver's seat of a compact car, I drifted off to sleep. That's when my sister shook me awake with fear in her voice, telling me we needed to leave as soon as possible. I started my car while then asking what was happening, and that's when my heart then sunk as she pointed to a car parked about 15 feet away at a gas pump. She explained that the car parked with their lights off not too long after I leaned my seat back, and they never got out of their car. They just stared at us. The entire time I was sleeping, the person in the car just stared at us. By the time I was told the story, I was already leaving the parking lot looking for somewhere else to pull over so we could get the GPS started up again. As soon as we started driving out of that parking lot, the person at the gas pump turned on their car, still with no headlights. After following us for a bit, we pulled into a well-lit parking lot of a 24-hour store that seemed to have quite a few cars there. I think this made the other driver nervous as they drove right through the parking lot into the night, and we never saw them again after that. The story may not sound that scary to many out there, but for me, this is probably one of the most terrifying experiences of mine to this day. I have no clue what would have happened if we stayed there any longer, or if we didn't find that 24-hour store. I'm 24 years old, but this happened to me when I was 22. I used to work at a gas station. I never had to work nights, though. I just opened. Whenever I opened, I got to leave at around 4 p.m., which gives me time to go pick up my kids at daycare. One day was a slow day. My manager was in the office, which was super close to the front counter, so if you're sitting in the office and a customer comes in, you can literally take two steps to where the register was at. Anyways, I was leaning on the counter just talking to my manager when an older gentleman comes inside. I didn't really think anything of it. I just greeted him, and I went back to talking to my manager. 
I noticed that he went through the fountain drinks, and he started getting something to drink. He then comes back, and he was talking about how he normally gets free drinks from here. Now, let me give you a backstory about this before I started working there. There was an older lady who worked there for years. Unfortunately, though, she found out she had cancer, and it was way too late to get help, and she passed away. When he started to explain to me about her, I looked at my manager, and she was giving me that look, the kind of look that's like, just go ahead and give it to him so he can leave. So I just smiled at him, and I told him he could take the drink. I asked my manager who he was, and she then explained to me that when she first started working there, which by the way, she's been working there for a year or two, and she told me she only saw him one time, and something about him just really gave her the creeps. I just shrugged it off, and my manager left for the day. I was all by myself except for the cook. I decided to do my usuals, the inventory, stocked, cleaning, and also helping some customers out whenever they needed it. Another customer came in, and I greeted them, and it was the same man. There was just something about the vibe he gave off, and he really sent chills down my spine. We had a little table that was close to the kitchen where all of the customers can sit down and eat and drink. He decided to sit there, and he started talking to me while I was trying to finish up my work before my shift ended. No matter which aisle I was going to, he would always follow me. He was making me very uncomfortable, calling me these sweet names when they were really just giving me the creeps. He would get really close to me, to the point where I can literally smell alcohol, so I'm assuming that he's a drunk, but yet he was still acting like he wasn't. It was at this point that I decided to go to the cooler just to get away from him. While I was stocking up all the drinks, I had heard the door open. So I went around to see who it was, and lo and behold, it was him. I told him he wasn't allowed in the cooler, and that he really needed to leave. He apologized, saying that he just wanted to talk, but he did leave the cooler. 3.30pm comes by, and my coworker who we'll call Ashley comes inside. When she noticed that this man was following me around the store, she got really annoyed by it. She went up to the man, and she actually told him that if he doesn't leave me alone, she wouldn't hesitate to call the police. The look on his face when she said that, it was scary. I have never seen anyone scream and cuss someone out in my life like he did. I really don't know how Ashley didn't get scared, but she was literally just standing there with a blank face, not even caring. He left soon after, and I haven't seen him since. This may not be that scary to a lot of you, but just imagine a creepy man following you around in a store, and you have no idea what his true intentions are. I'm really glad that's all he did. It really could have ended up a lot worse. I worked at a gas station in my small North Carolinian town 10 miles from Charlotte. I was a 39-year-old wife and a mother of three daughters. I was a stay-at-home mom and my daughters were all in school. And at the time, my family really needed a little extra income. The area was predominantly safe. My hours were 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. My duties were being a cashier, of course, stocking products, cleaning, doing nightly audits, and reading every Dean Koontz novel I could get my hands on. All of this by myself, I should add. The company didn't feel a need for a second person on this shift because it was really slow, but on weekends, very hectic. I handled this job like a pro. I really loved seeing my regulars at night and the morning workers getting their coffee and heading to work. I was at this gas station, which was also a bit of a convenience store, for about a year. I did have the run-of-the-mill meth heads who liked their sweets. The homeless looking for freebie six or somewhere to charge their phone. I also had the occasional local police officers that would come in at around 12 to 1 a.m. for free coffee and bitch about their shift. On this particular night, 
I was reading the Dean Koontz novel Intensity. I put the bookmark in because I felt like moving around. I went around the counter to the five hour energy shots and I began to organize and stock. I heard the bell above the door like I had a million times before. I had so many regulars, ranging from pizza delivery guys to EMTs. I was setting the case of five hour energy shots down to help this customer when I felt something cold and hard against my right shoulder blade. My first instinct was that this was a cruel prank from a regular. I turned around to say so when I was then met with a gun pointing at my forehead. It was an African American guy with a bandana on half of his face. I immediately put my hands up in shock. I looked around and I saw that there were three more guys in different colored bandanas with no gun but looking nervous and then demanding me to give all the money. I walked around the counter with this guy holding his gun right to my head and telling me, Hurry up! Give me the money! Open the register! I said with my hands still in the air and shaking, Yes, yes, of course, here! And I opened up the register for him. The other four guys descended on this register, getting all the cash in the register. Suddenly, the gunman looked at me, then said, This register too, bitch! There was a second register that had the bare minimum for the first shift to open up with. I put in my code, and I opened that register as well. They cleaned out that one too. They then saw the safe underneath the first register, and again, the gunman pointed his gun to my temple and also demanded I open the safe. I said in a shaky voice that the safe is on a timer. If you press one button, whether it be for the $10 bills or a roll of quarters, it won't dispense again for a whole two minutes. The guys were all on the safe pressing buttons, while in the meantime, I'm praying out loud for God to spare me, because I have a husband and children that need me. I kept frantically saying this prayer, and the guys were all frustrated that the safe wasn't giving them what they wanted. I heard one of the guys saying, One of you shut that bitch up! And another said, Just shoot her already! We already have what we need! Right at that statement, I could literally feel I was about to lose my bladder and pee all over myself. Even though I was scared out of my mind, I was also mad as hell that this was possibly going to be where I ended up. I held in that pee, and I just watched as they started to steal as many cigarettes, wraps, and black and miles as they could. One of the guys then yelled, We've been here too long. Let's go. Let's get the hell out of here. Three of them were sprinting out the door, while one was in front of me, all while I was shaking with clenched hands praying. I looked up, and then his bandana fell down. I thought this was it for me, but he then just smiled at me, and he joined his friends. At the very same time, a woman came inside to buy a soda. They yelled at her too, pointing the gun at her to give them her purse. The lady replied back with, I'm not giving you my purse, motherfucker! And I thought for sure they would get aggressive. Instead, however, they seemed to just be worried about being there too long. They then ran out the door and scattered through the parking lot. I looked at the lady, then the glass door, and I could see her partner's truck sitting outside. I told her to go to her truck while I called the police. I then locked the door as soon as she was in the truck. I picked up the store's landline and I dialed 911. I ran to the stockroom and I locked that door as well. I told the 911 operator of all the details she needed and after only a couple of minutes, she said it was safe to go to the front door for the officers. And I did just that. I unlocked the door and I immediately removed my name tag and threw it in the trash. I felt like this was finally over and I was obviously quitting. I saw the woman customer that was confronted by the gunman just shaking and she was rocking back and forth. I put my hand on her shoulder as she also gave her own statement to the police. I gave the officers my statement and I called my manager. She came to the store along with CSI investigators. I had to watch myself on tape at least three times with the investigators. At one point, 
A CSI guy paused the video while the thieves were surrounding the safe and their back was turned. And he asked me, Ma'am, why didn't you run? Because I was afraid I'd be shot in the back, I said. The man apologized immediately, realizing how traumatized I really was. After the police left, I continued to converse with my manager as she tried to console me. She then called her manager because she had never been through anything like this. I actually heard upper management tell her, Oh, she'll be alright. No need for me to get out of bed for this. I literally lost it, and I told her she was a piece of shit. I eventually went home, and around this time it's four in the morning. I race upstairs, and I kiss all my children on their foreheads. I then went to mine and my husband's bedroom, and I went into our bathroom to wash my face. I was thinking in my head that I didn't want to wake him up, because he has another hour to sleep before shift for his job begins. I couldn't help but to break down after realizing I was alive and that I was now at home splashing water on my face. My husband woke up to this and he asked in a slight panic, What's wrong, babe? What's going on? I broke down to my knees on my bathroom floor and I then explained my entire nightmare night to him. He held me and consoled me. I stayed up until it was time to take my children to school. When I got back home, I called the company's HR. They were very cold towards me. I then decided to call a workers' compensation lawyer. After discussing what happened to me on my third shift all by myself, as well as the HR being so cold towards me, he took my case. I discovered that the four guys that robbed me at gunpoint were all 16 years old. I don't know what punishment they ever received, but I do know that I got one year of unemployment checks, as well as a settlement of $25,000. I also received therapy for the PTSD that I now have. It took about a year for me to be able to go to a gas station all on my own. It's been about four years since, and I'm doing okay now. That is, as long as I have my two knives and a taser with me. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night everyone, and remember, to always, stay.